Hello. Yes, okay, we're starting. I will make some short announcements. Uh, okay. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or the participants of the of this lecture series. We're happy to announce uh, the third day of our lectures, and it's quite pity that it's already the end of the seminar, but we are still very happy to see the new countries and new scientists from the um, today from the are uh, also from the south hemisphere and uh, this is my big big pleasure to announce the lecture of uh, professor Edgardo Ladbruse who is um, uh, uh, the speaker from Brazil and uh, he has quite outstanding international career and uh, very well known in the um, uh, fluvial geomorphology and the uh, uh, adjacent fields of research and so, so we also are very grateful for uh, Edgardo to accept our invitation to make this lecture which I'm pretty sure is very relevant and very uh, valuable for both Russian uh, young scientists and international young scientists as well as for researchers in general so uh, please Edgardo you're welcome Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sergei. Uh, for me, it's a huge pleasure uh, being part of this uh, important uh, school for, for young scientists. Um, I want to deeply thank you, uh, the organizing committee uh, from the Mega, Megapolis and this Moscow State University. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate. I'm going to synthesize uh, today some results from large rivers in South America. The name of uh, the, the title of my, my presentation is Continental Sediment Sourcing and the Human Factors in Large Tropical Rivers. Uh, allow me to introduce what I'm doing in terms of uh, large rivers around the world. For more than 20 years, I developed this uh, program uh, on large rivers, long-term basin evolution, morphodynamics, and global change, where I'm linking different approaches, the study of fluvial basins through time, from past to present, uh, long-term evolution of uh, a continental scale, quaternary research, and so on, uh, hydrogeomorphological processes, uh, and the human impacts on river basins, and today the focus is going to be this component of my research program is production and routing of sediment at continental scale. Uh, with my team, we have been working, I created this in Brazil many years ago, moved to the United States, to, to Singapore, working with these uh, rivers around the planet. We are working with some of the biggest ones, the Amazon, Madeira, Negro, large rivers in Asia like the Irrawaddy, and so on, and, but also with the largest mega funds, fluvial mega funds in the planet. What is my school and what I, I, I apply with my team? We integrate typical methods for quaternary research, uh, stratigraphy, sedimentology, geomorphology, mapping, a lot of field work. I'm not a modeler. I'm a person that is bas basically based on information we collect in the field and after we, of course, do modeling or interpretation and so on but it's very field-based in my research. Uh, for river morphodynamic, we have a totally different approach, like many of the people that probably was presenting in, in, the, in this, this school that you organize, is, is, is we use a different acoustic uh, uh, equipment like uh, ADCPs, uh, echo sounds, uh, to study present-day morphodynamics, sub-bottom profilers, uh, we collect samples, uh, and, and, and so on in the field, we study the present day dynamic of rivers. Uh, you see, we, ha we have to use any kind of boats depending on the areas of the world we are working. After we collect all this information, uh, we study also the sediments in the lab. Um, and we use the typical techniques that everybody uses for mineralogy, geochemistry, uh, suspended sediment concentrations. And in my life, I used to have uh, geochronologies as well, particularly led to 10 for recent chronologies uh, of sediment rates. And we do all the processing in uh, remote sensing. You presented the, the Sergei presented this application of remote sensing in rivers uh, in, the, in, the, in the school. 
And we use similar kind of techniques uh, as well from remote sensing. I'm going to discuss today an approach that we call source to sync and have been became very popular now because we can quantify these fluxes through fluvial basins. And they are important because allow us to develop this kind of approaches, a quantitative model of landscape evolution, or to establish your chemical and sediment mass balances in large basins, uh, estimating continental or regional uh, rate of erosion, but also in terms of applied science, um, this uh, approach uh, allows us to understand the links between this uh, hydrophysical functioning of these rivers and the fresh water and coastal ecological processes and to design basic management strategies to mitigate hazards, many, many kind of applications. Why South America should be so important on a global scale when we talk about big rivers? Uh, think about that South America uh, holds the longest mountain chain of the planet, the Andes. Remember that a good part of the continent is uh, comprising the tropical zone, from the tropics here in the north to the uh, Tropic of uh, Capricorn here in the south, so part of the continental mass is in the tropical region. Uh, we have, we say, the longest mountain chains, and as a consequence, we have also the longest foreland system of the planet here, surrounding the Andes in green coral. It means that related to this forest land, we have, in addition to that, big, big areas of uh, plains. Uh, we always think about the Andes, but, but you consider uh, the mean elevation of the continent, South America is even lower than Africa, that doesn't hold too much big mountains, right? So it means that the, it's a pretty low landscape. Um, because of the Andes, all the moisture that is coming from the Atlantic became uh, um, precipitating on the east side of the Andes. We have a lot of area uh, east of the Andes because this backbone is very asymmetric. They create very short river going to the Pacific and very long basin going to the Atlantic. And all this moisture is coming from east to west and is capturing these basins. So that means that's the reason we have so such a big amount of big basins in, and big rivers in South America. We have also the largest fluvial megafans of the planet in South America and measure intercratonic and continental uh, basins. So I will going to discuss here uh, quickly, we don't, don't have too much time, it's just a brief presentation on the source area of sediments in, in the continent, how we transfer this sediment, how we trap these sediments, and how we can build sediment budgets because now these natural fluxes are being modified by humans. I would like to highlight that South America is very well drained. It's not comparable to many other continents like North America, even Africa. Look at these seven basins that we have here. Number one is the Amazon, right? Number two is the Paraná Basin. Number three is the Orinoco Basin. Number four, the, San Fran the Araguaia Tocantins Basins. Number five, the San Francisco Basin. And number six, the Magdalena Basin, right? Only these six basins are draining more than two thirds, more than 75% of the continent, right? And it's very well organized draining system. But when we have a lot of the students participating here. When I teach, I always ask my, my, my student, what, who are the largest rivers of the world in water discharge? And of course, some of the Russian colleagues are going to look at me and say, mm, I can complain because some of the big Arctic rivers are very similar in size to the Paraná or to the Mississippi, like Yenisei or Obi, all right? So, uh, but see, we consider more or less the literature, the 10 largest rivers of the world in water discharge probably are these ones, right? And we see that in reality, we have only seven large rivers here. In the Yangtze and Brahmaputra in Asia, the Congo in Africa, the Mississippi in North America, and the Orinoco, Amazonas, and Paraná in South America. So what about the others? Well, if we consider rivers like independent units, three of the largest rivers of the world in water discharge are tributaries of the Amazon system. 
And they are the Madeira River number four in this map here. Number five here is the uh, Negro River. And here, like number eight, is the Kakitash Apura River coming from the Andes of Colombia. So from the 10 largest rivers of the world, we have six in South America. And we have, we have here the mean annual discharge, the Amazon is the biggest one with more than 200,000 cubic meters per second. Uh, Orinoco is 35,000. Madeira is 32, Negro 30,000. Chapula 18, right? So Paraná 18. Probably the Shenisei is close to these values together with the Mississippi 16, 17. We have to get more rivers close approaching this between 14 and 17 cubic meters per second. But you can see that the, Ori the Madeira and the Negro are twice the size basically of the Mississippi River in North America. Also, it's a fluvial paradise in terms of tropical rivers. 24 of the 44 largest tropical rivers of the world in water discharge in South America. 18 of them are related to the Amazon Basin or the Amazon Forest. <clears throat> we published this many years ago in Tropical Rivers paper in Geomorphology 2005 with Estebo, Jose Estebo from Brazil <clears throat> and Rashid Sinha from India. <clears throat> South America is incredible for rivers. We have also a huge environmental mosaic of continental aquatic ecosystems. And the largest continuous belt of floodplains. <clears throat> the continent also holds the largest and most diverse fluvial well, wetland of the world. For example, in the, in the flooded forests of the Amazon, we can find more than 900 flood tolerant tree species. Um, we have you know, more than 2,000 freshwater fish species in the Amazon. To have an idea, to give you an idea, the Congo, the second largest river that also is in the tropics, only have more or less 700 fish species. So one third of the Amazon. But what about sediments? Well, you for sure are very familiar with the international literature. And we can see in these global assessments that the area that produces more sediments that takes export from continents to the oceans is Southeast Asia and East Asia. So you can see from the 80s with Milliman and, and Mead paper to the present uh, assessment of global uh, discharge of sediment to the ocean by Milliman and Fansworth that <coughs> no much change. <coughs> in terms of the sediments. <clears throat> Sorry. So many authors have been claiming for decades that Southeast Insular Asia, Java, Borneo, Sumatra, and PNG produce with 2% of the total land of the planet, more than 20% of the global sediment transfer to the ocean. Miniman and others have been also claiming that if we compare basin at different scale from a small basin you can see in this field, to big basins, in any continent, Southeast Asia is always producing more than other continents. Well, we were not very sure about that. We, started to believe that big mountains like the Himalayas and the Andes were producing similar values than Southeast Asia or even more. So in 2014, we published this paper with Juan Restrepo, Professor Juan Restrepo from Colombia, analyzing 119 gauge station with real data with sediments, suspended sediment measurements along the Andes. And this was got a very interesting results because we know with the distribution of the mountains uh, uh, gauge stations, right? In every area of the Andes, from the north to south, we divide the Andes in morphotectonics and morphoclimatic regions. All the Andes were producing huge amount of sediment, and the sediment production was decreasing toward the south. And we can see here that the Andes are feeding some of this big river I mentioned before, the Orinoco, the Amazon, and toward the south, the Paraná Basin. <clears throat> and the arrows here 
represent the size of the flags going toward the east flanks of the Andes. Our conclusion is that the Andes produce internal sediment yield as much or even more than many other systems, including the Himalayas and Southeast Asia or New Zealand that traditionally is in the literature like one of the major areas that produce with high sediment yields in the paper in science, nature and geology. Finally, we published this in geomorphology. So this 2014 paper on the Andes and we estimated that 2.5, 3.3 gigaton of sediment are exported from the Andes, are produced in the Andes over these big rivers, right? And every area produces a lot. And the magnitude of sediment yield in the Andes is similar or even bigger than Southeast, Insular Asia, and other areas that are postulated to be the most productive in the planet. So this postulation here that Southeast Asia produces more than every part of the world is not true. If this is happening in the continent, why? How we explain that not too much sediment in theory is reaching the ocean? Well, maybe one explanation is that we have sinks in the plant in, the, in South America that are trapping these sediments. So this sediment is not able to be exported to the oceans, right? Let's check the big sinks in South America. Well, the major sinks are Piedmont allu alluvial mountain valleys, La Rivers, Megafans, and other abodes systems. In this 2014 paper with Professor Restrepo, we estimated that 0.5 to 1.7 gigatons of sediment are deposited in the intermountain and surrounding proximal sedimentary basin. What about megafans? You probably know the megafans in the indo gangetic plain, the Kosi megafan or the Okebango megafan in Africa and so on. But the biggest megafan of the planet are in the Chaco plain in South America. Here are the Andes. This is Bolivia, Northern Argentina and Paraguay. So we have these big megafans coming from the Andes entering in the Chaco plain. And these rivers are not very big in terms of water discharge, but they are very rich in sediments. The concentration of sediments in this river can reach more than 40,000 milligrams per liter. It's very muddy material, right? So the Pilco Marshall Megafan is the biggest one in our planet. And the extension of this Megafan is two, more than 200,000 square kilometers in area. Huge, huge area. These Megafans are trapping hundreds of millions of tons. For example, in yellow, you can see here, more than 200 million tons every year are captured in this megafan going toward the Paraná Basin. And near 100 million tons of sediment are trapping in this megafan draining toward the Amazon Basin to the north. It's a very active sedimentary basin. This sediment never arrives to the ocean, right? Became trapped in the continent. And here we have all this area in red trapping huge amount of sediments in the continent. Another area with me, big megafan is here, where appear this number eight, that is the famous Pantanal of Mato Grosso. It's another area of wetlands. You can see some picture of the Pantanal here. It's the biggest active wetlands in, in South America, and one of the biggest in the world. And these megafans are very big. The Taquari megafans is three and a half times bigger than the Kosi megafan in India. So big. But this area is the cratonic area of Brazil. It's the old shield area and sedimentary old rocks. They don't produce too much sediment. So the sediment yields in these landscapes in eastern Brazil, in the Brazilian shield, are pretty low. That's the reason the sedimentation in this megafan is not so big. Where else? we can trap sediment. Big rivers can trap sediment. For example, some rivers that are very unstable and they shift by a bullshit. So in the Beni Plain here in Bolivia, these rivers are very meander meandering and they shift and they can tra trap big amount of sediment. Brazilian, uh, American, and mainly French scientists 
like Guyot, Emmanuel Gautier, and others have been working in this river and they say that the trapping can reach more than 280 million tons of sediment that are not arriving to the Amazon system downstream. They became trapped here. What area we can find in the continent that is trapped into much sediment that is cannot be exported to the ocean? Well, large river like the Amazon also can trap a lot of sediment in the flat plain. So these rivers are not in equilibrium at all since the late places. We published with one of my former students, our professor in Singapore, Edward Park, one of my PhD students, this assessment of uh, sediment bashes in the lower Amazon in 2019 in geology. And we demonstrated that the lower Amazon here is trapping using, you know, uh, remote sensing field calibrated model, with a lot of field work to calibrate this model along the river, that more than 120 million tons per year are being stored in the Amazon flat plain downstream Manaus. The sediment is not reaching the ocean at all. So very active also sedimentation traps in this flat plain. We are working now with my colleague Ramonel in University of Santa Fe in Argentina, uh, analyzing the trapping of sediments in the Paraná River. And we can see here, for example, in red, how much sediment we are trapping in the flat plain. And 16 to 60 million tons of sediment, the Paraná is going here to the Atlantic, 16 to 60 million tons of sediment are trapped every year in the Paraná River in Argentina as well. Okay, but humans have been modifying these fluxes in recent times, right? These were natural traps. We are modifying this. And the major impact we have in South America and La River are deforestation, large cover change in the basins, or dams that are modifying the hydrosedimentological regime of these rivers. Let us see quickly what is going on with human impacts. The two biggest rivers that are strongly impacted by deforestation, so dams is not a big issue here, it's deforestation, are the Araguaya, number four in this map, and the Magdalena, number six in the northern uh, Andes of Colombia. The Magdalena have been very well studied by my colleague Juan Restrepo and many of his collaborators. And Colombia has been suffering a strong deforestation in the last decade. This is some, some uh, figure from day papers, not my material, it's Professor Restrepo and collaborator papers. And um, they conclude that the sediment yield are increasing drastically in this area of the continent. The Magdalena is one of the most productive large rivers in terms of sediment yield. And, you know, the sediment yield is increasing 35% during the last decade from 550 tons per square kilometer per year to more than 700 tons per, kilometer per year, square kilometers per year because of deforestation. Another area that has been strongly impacted is the Cerrado Bayon. The Cerrado Bayon here in yellow used to be the largest savannas areas of Brazil along covering 2 million square kilometers. It was destroyed to increase the production of soybean, sugar cane in the last decades. And the Araguaya River is the biggest river in this area, uh, was also highly impacted. It's a very uh, dynamic river, an anabranching river with tendency to bridle, a lot of sediment uh, transport, of, uh, mainly sand. You see the mean annual discharge, more than 6,000 cubic meters, so more or less used to be the, probably the size of the Volga River before regulation by, by humans. Um, all these areas have been deforested. Look at the deforestation in the basin in red, have been dramatic. And all these areas have big saprolites in the cratonics terrain that have been eroded and increasing the sediment level of these rivers. So this river is suffering atrophy, uh, strong sedimentation, metamorphosis, uh, huge rate of vertical accretion, and so on. And this uh, is our conclusion from some paper that in the last decade, we have been storing more than 200 million tons of sediments in the alluvial plain as a consequence of deforestation and increasing, like you can see in this figure, through the decades, the amount of sediment transport, bed load, mainly sand. This river is not transporting mud, it's mainly sand uh, in, the, in the area. And the problem is no climate change. We are, you know, the politics are very comfortable with climate change. San Juan is 
changing climate. No, what we are doing is modifying our basins, destroying our basins with land use changes. The big problem here is not climate change, but all these changes that we see in the hydrology are mainly produced in this charts and so on because the modification of the hydrological regime by deforestation. What about dams? I don't global assessment. Be very careful. People is now like to, to work with the global scale because we have computer, database, statistic, but we can get a lot of mistakes. This is a big mistake, for example. We have a basic trap in efficiency in basins in around the world and appear 100% the Orinoco, 80% or 60% in the Paraná. What is a big mistake? This is not real because people are not familiar with the realities. Like you are familiar, for example, with Russian River, and we get this general information, and we put less about Russia, and we don't understand what is going on. So in Brazil, all this river on the East Coast, like the San Francisco, Fai, Araguaia, Tocantins, and Paraná, have been totally impacted and regulated by dams. Remember that 90% of the power is coming from hydropower in, the, in Brazil, it's one of the biggest economies in the world. All these rivers today have artificial regimes. You can see many rivers in Europe, uh, for example, or North America. This is an example for my colleague, Professor Jose Estebo from Brazil. The big dam that we have in the upper Paraná is a big area, one million square kilometers, and the longitudinal profile of the river is all modified by dams. Practically no sediment is exported downstream in these dams. But the river is still getting all the sediment coming from the Andes toward the Atlantic. That's the reason the sediment trapping is not so big for suspended load. What about the Amazon? The Amazon is in big problems because there is a plan to build more than, you know, uh, hundreds of dams in the Amazon in the next years. Uh, we published this paper in Nature in 2017. It's a multidisciplinary team, the ecologists, economists, social scientists, biologists, uh, analyzing the impact of that in the Amazon and the potential impacts on that. So the Cratonic River draining the Brazilian shale, they don't transport too much muddy sediment in suspended load, but transport a lot of um, sandy load. So they depend mainly on the flat pulses, but not, about, not, not from the sediments. The most important dam built here is the Xingu River Montebello Dam is the third, number three, largest dam in the planet after uh, Three Gorges and Etaipu. So it became very famous by the conflict with the Indian people, indigenous uh, people, but it's not most, the most relevant in terms of fluvial impacts. The most dramatic impacts is in the Tapachos River, the second largest uh, cratonic river of the Amazon, where they, if the government build a sequence of dams, the impound area will be more than 1,000 kilometers in length. That should be crazy to do in this time. The length is more than the Mississippi for comparison from Memphis to New Orleans or a line from Madrid to, you know, far from Paris. Uh, that should be the length. Today, today should be impossible to impound a river like this in such a station. It should be not acceptable. But Climate change have been favoring all this. The, the theory of climate change have been favoring this because, oh, climate change is happening. We have to produce hydropower to avoid, you know, carbon and to avoid fossil, fuel, fossil fuels. And people were justifying building dams in the tropics, which, which have been a disaster. Um, another problem at the end, we have a small catchment, I, but I told you that they feed the Amazon system. More than 90% of the sediment of the Amazon is coming from this catchment in the Andes. We have two bottlenecks the, for sediments. One is in the north. The Ucayali and Marañón River are exporting sediment to the Amazon here in the north. And the Madeira is exporting sediment from the south here and joining the Amazon in this point and introducing half of the sediment of the Amazon that are transported to the ocean. Uh, what is the problem with this? If we create more and more dams, we are going to affect all these fluxes of sediment toward the ocean. Two big mega dams were built recently in the Amazon, in the Madeira River, close to the Bolivian border. Here is the Amazon, here is the Madeira. These are the biggest 
run of river projects in the world, dams in the world. The Madeira here is bigger in terms of water discharge and sediment that used to be three gorge in the Yangtze River, in the, in the three gorge area. So it's a very big, big system. Uh, and this used to be habitat of more than thousand species. Now we have dams here that started to modify the hydro sedimentological behavior of the river. And it starts to appear several uh, problems in terms of flood because of the regulation of flood. And it's a very flat area, and we don't have capacity to regulate the floods. Uh, we presented in this nature paper in 2017 some results on the Madeira, and we noticed that sediment concentration of the river started to decrease in recent times since this dam started to operate. The major conclusion on our paper in, in, science, in nature is that, let's to concentrate on the, this slide here, the, the lower, uh, most lower uh, rich, uh, lower uh, right side in this slide, is that the Madeira is the most vulnerable river to dams in the Amazon basin. The second most vulnerable areas are the Ucayali and Marañón rivers in the Andes of Peru. These two rivers are the ones that join and create the Amazon. And um, in the Cratonic area, the most vulnerable river is the Tapachos River, the one I showed you. Uh, that is the dam cell construct is going to be in big problems. We recently, with the colleague from Ecology and Biology, published this paper a few months ago, crossing the information of the, this DEVI, that is the Dam Environmental and Vulnerability Index I created for the Amazon for this nature paper. And biodiversity, and it's very, very scary because the most vulnerable rivers in terms of that are those also that hold the biggest diversity of fish, birds, and fish. What about mega scale impacts? One of the problems we face when with these projects is that uh, this environmental study, environmental impact assessment for when we construct the dam are very localized. So they don't integrate all the fluxes at the scale uh, of, uh, of a vast basin size. So this is what's happened today when the sediment arrived to the ocean. So the Amazon plume is very big, spread on one million square kilometer. All the sediment go to the north and feed big, big areas of mangroves in the continents, right, along the coastal um, a region of South America, northern coastal area. We have been modeling this with uh, Edward Park, uh, my former student, and you can see what can happen if we decrease the sediment because we are trapping sediment with dams in the continent. In the floodplain, you see the decrease of sediment transfer into the floodplain that are very rich in biodiversity, and also how much we can decrease the transferring of sediments to the ocean in the plume. And this is the animation that you can see the different modeling so 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50% decrease of sediment arriving to the ocean. The plume here created an anomaly in sea surface temperature that modified the path of tropical storm going toward the Gulf of Mexico. This was modeled by a colleague from the University of Texas in, in, in the in climate modeling. So this is dramatic impact that we can produce if we modify the Amazon uh, fluxes uh, with dams. But I want to call your attention, particularly as the young students, because everybody talks in the media about the Amazon, but the most dramatic problem in South America in terms of uh, environmental issues is the Cerrado biome. The Cerrado, I mentioned, were the biggest savannas of Brazil, two million square kilometers of savannas, that have been destroyed during the last decade to expand the agricultural frontier. We are here cropping soybean mainly to export to China to, you know, to do oil and to feed pigs. So we are destroying all the biodiversity just to make, you know, to produce oil and to feed pigs in China. Uh, the problem is that the pressure on this environment is catastrophic. 70% was disappeared because of deforestation. And now we have hundreds and hundreds of dams 
more than 700 dams being planned to be built in these rivers. You can see the deforestation. This is a new paper that we published a few months ago. The deforestation in each basin, some areas, they don't have more forest at all. The upper Paraná basin doesn't hold any kind of forest basically today, right? And we have increased pressure by irrigation as well. And this is very, very used to be and still having a lot of biodiversity. More than 800 flood tolerant tree species and one quarter of the whole biodiversity of uh, fish in the continent. Yeah? More than 1,600 species of fish are in this area, right? Um, the only river that is not regulated by dam is the Araguaya, is the most beautiful river of the Cerrado. And we have several areas of conservation here. So we are fighting now to preserve this river. It's the last river to be preserved for the next generation of Brazilians without impacts by dams. So this is our environmental fine now, I'm working with the San authorities in collaboration about to save this big. I don't have too much time, but I want to make some conclusion about not only rivers, but how this model of development and economy is impacting our rivers. So the justification to build dams is the economic growing. We need power, so we need these dams to produce uh, hydropower. Good. But our concern is not that we don't have to build it, it's how and where we have to build it. So we believe that it's necessary, a better study, to understand where we need to build, why we need to build these dams, or if we have to look for alternative projects and not this project that have been recycled, you know, from uh, the 60s or the 70s. All these dams were postulated decades ago uh, to be built in the 60s and the 70s, and the location of these places was not changing at all. And we have new technology that allow us to understand better where we can put these projects. For example, at the time these projects were proposed in the 60s and 70s, people were only looking to next parts. We are in the launch to up the fire, we have a break, okay, we have a rapid, we put it down, we produce energy. Now we have technology, we can find better places to do that, not only the typical uh, waterfalls and so on. But well, the second business, is agribusiness. So a good part of the export of Brazil are related to agribusiness. So the record was reached in 2018 for agribusiness export, and Brazil got $101 billion in export from agribusiness. But deforested area was 2.5, 2.4 million square kilometers to produce this country $1 billion in export. It means more or less, a little less than the size of Kazakhstan or the size of Argentina, the number eight and nine biggest countries in the planet. Think about the extension of this destruction to produce 100 billion tons of exports in agribusiness. But who are the biggest agricultural exporters in the war in terms of food? Well, this is a big surprise. We know that the Dutch are the second largest uh, export of agricultural products after the United States. So the Dutch, with only 20,000 square kilometers of agricultural land, exported at the same year than Brazil, 100, $102 billion. They export is more or less similar amount, a little more than Brazil, only using this small amount of territory by using very, very advanced technology and a very, very developed agribusiness model. So look at the comparison between David and Goliath. Brazil with 2.4 million square kilometers deforested is equivalent to 122 times nether agricultural land to produce exactly the same. So per hectare, the, the Brazil is producing 45, 42, uh, US dollar per square kilometer, and the Dutch are producing more than $5 million per square kilometer. Look at the efficiency to use the land. So this is a very important model that we have to change. 
in Brazil, we don't need more deforestation. We have to use the brain to improve how we can produce more and more with the huge areas that we already have deforested. Well, um, I'm finishing now because I believe that it's very interesting having your questions. Uh, I hope I can answer, if possible, uh, to the question you are interested in. But in conclusion, we can say about South America that in many areas, right, uh, several of the largest basins are being modified, regulated, and fragmented. Uh, what is happening? In some areas, we have a starvation of sediment transfer to the ocean. For example, all these areas of the Kraton, because of the amount of dams, is not uh, exporting too much to the ocean. So we have less sediment arriving to the ocean here, right? So in other areas, we have an increase of sediment yields, like in the Andes of Colombia, in the Magdalena, or the central area of Brazil in the Araguaia River, right? So we are modifying all these uh, fluxes you know, with human activities. Um, I could say that uh, persisting this model of development, the natural condition of the Amazon will be deeply impacted in two or at maximum three decades. But my message is, okay, you read this about the Amazon in the news, but remember and help us to disseminate that the most critical environmental situation is faced by the Cerrado Bayon, the big savannas of Brazil. It's not the Amazon, and you never read a single news about the Cerrado. We propose that using and adapting and making more efficient the existing institutional framework that we have in South America and a different country, we can improve the management plan for our rivers. This is important when I compare with some Asian countries and African countries. In Brazil and other countries of South America, we have very good environmental legislation. The only thing we have is to enforce the legislation. We have to improve a little the legislation, but we have a very good starting point to do that. And scientists are fundamental. They have to participate. We are doing that so we can change in some way to impact the decision uh, makings in our countries. Well, thank you very much. And see that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Edgardo, for excellent insights into the uh, South America. Uh, hydrology and sedimentology issues. Uh, I would say that uh, even from the perspective of the photos, your lecture is something very outstanding to look at. So, and I would uh, go to the immediately to the questions that we uh, got and uh, start from the question from uh, Ademi Olusala, the University Free State. Uh, South Africa, and uh, has there been any study to know the origin of the sediments? Also, any sedimentary core taken to know their early accumulation in the field? How is it? Sorry, Sergei, um, can you repeat it? Yes, so the question is about the origin of the sediments. So maybe you can just briefly comment uh the some something like a sediment budget related to the origin of the sediments and so also there's a question if you used or you, are there some data about from the sedimentary cores Brilliant. okay yes uh, well we have different time scale right there is people coming you see in very long day or whatever to analyze these long-term rates of uh, sediment yields uh in the basis uh, what we have in the, in the continent is that the maximum amount of sediment that we transfer through the continent is produced by the Andes. But right? For example, in the Amazon, more than 90% is produced by the Andes. So we have this an assessment of long-term erosional rate with this uh, technology, like the little pen, radios, and so on. But um, the ones I presented today are historical measurements of sediment uh, transport real data of sediment transport uh, in recent times. Um, one message here is that um, the Andes produce basically the huge amount, the cratonic areas of Brazil and central part of the continent, they don't produce too much. These areas, they can be pretty high, you know, thousand, 2,000 meters or even more, but these cratons, they source mainly rivers with sand, 
they don't source river with mud. So we don't have muddy materials in these systems, right? So the nature of uh, the type of load that we source uh, and the proportion of suspended uh, muddy material related to sandy material is, is, is different, right? Um, the sediment bashes have been changing during the quaternary. For example, it's a very interesting question by the colleague because the mega fan that I mentioned, they are a very good indicators of that. The big mega fan of the Chaco are complex quaternary landforms. So the biggest extension of this mega fan will reach on, in the place to see. The, the, the present day fans are smaller. So we had, yes, we had bigger production of sediment during the last glacier. And to give an example how this was changing through time. Right? And also it does answer a little the question. I'm not sure I got it. Yes, okay, thanks. I guess that's that's good for our, the, uh, the participants. And then uh, there is the question from uh, our students of uh, Moscow State University with the nickname Babushka Bukashka. Uh, the question is, is the human influence in Amazon basin so significant considering its huge sizes and sparsely populated areas? Uh, so it's to the topic very of visibility point. of the study. Yeah, very good point. Yes, uh, I could say that if we analyze today the Amazon, that's the reason our concern, when I presented this uh, paper in Nature, was the vulnerability to dams that will be built. What happens if we build this, right? Many of these dams were not built, were proposed. We are trying to anticipate what is going to happen if we modify the flags. So currently the Amazon is still in pretty good shape in terms of river. We don't have too much dams yet. Uh, we don't have too much intervention on the river. The deforestation has been significantly less than other biomes, like the Cerrado. The problem here is important for the question, is that what people understand by Amazon is a problem. One thing is the Amazon basin, one thing is the Amazon forest. One thing is the legal territory of the Amazon. So when we see in the news, the deforestation of the Amazon, many times we are talking about Cerrado biome because the legal territory includes Bayonne, Amazon forest, Bayonne, Cerrado. The biggest deforestation is in the Cerrado, right? That's very important. So the Amazon is still not getting too much impact, but it's growing fast. So I mentioned, for example, the two mega dams in the Madeira. They are impacting the Madeira, the biggest tributary. We have the third largest dam in the Xingu, that this is impacting as well the Cratonic Sound. We have already um, some complicated expansion of uh, deforestation mining in uh, the Peruvian Andes, for example, that is in regionally impacting, right, the, the basin. And um, I mean, uh, and now we have, uh, we are studying with Jorge Abad from Peru, the impact of waterways. The Chinese now are, uh, and with the Peruvian government are trying to modify the Ucayali and Marañón rivers for dredging and so on and rectification of meanders. That can be very, very, very serious issue in the, in the Amazon. So the flux is still okay. The, the system is still more or less okay by it's accelerating increasing the pressure on the system by human activities. Right? That, that's the reality we are facing. If we build all this dam, it's going to be very, very serious. Okay. Okay. Nice. Thanks, Garda. And so, so I proceed with the question from the audience. So the next is also from uh, Moscow State University student. Do you use uh, uh, Moscow State University student Christina Prokopieva? Do you use other remote sensing data sets from satellite system besides Landsat for sediment transport uh, studies? Yes, um, yeah, very good question. Uh, yeah, we use any kind of, uh, of, of product that we can. Um, for example, when I was showing you um, our budget for the Amazon uh, and the Parana, right? Yes, you can use Landsat. Uh, we can be using in this, uh, the river is big, so we can be using a lot of MODIS. 
because allow us to get a weekly, you know, uh, measurement and average in this uh, each day's uh, average and it worked very well. Uh, so this model in geology, we use MODIS. In some area, we have been using MODIS. We have been area, we have been using Landsat uh, for sediment tra transport. So yeah, feel free to use and calibrate what is useful to you and the scale that you have to, to study and, and how many, uh, you know, is the, what the frequency you want. We are now working in the Irrawaddy, looking at dredging, sediment, uh, sand mining, dredging. So we are using radar images as well, uh, and optical uh, images, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2. We are using everything that we can. So yeah, keep it open. Great, good, thanks. It's also a very popular topic in our research here with the remote sensing application. And uh, so the next uh, question, more general, maybe there are two more general questions. Maybe you can briefly comment them. So, and so the first is from Joseph uh, Wolfson from uh, Ingrates, uh, the Geochemical uh, Institute in Moscow. And the question is to, to geochemistry. It's, are there some significance or what's the significance of geochemical research in your investigations? Do you have some links uh, to studies yes. related to geochemistry. Yeah, yeah. Can I complete my previous question? I, I would like to highlight something about remote sensing before. Can be? Yes, of course, of course. It's up uh, to you. Re regarding remote sensing, I, I want to give a message to all the students that are attending this stuff. Don't use remote sensing model without field calibration. We have now, okay, I get the reflectancy, I have some you know, value here with the, the sensor, and I put some value for, for suspended sediment concentration, surface suspended sediment concentration with the remote sensor. And I use this. So all these global models that are not even being published are very bad. Don't do global models like that. One of the problems, for example, for the Amazon, we have to calibrate it with field data. And for each reach of the Amazon, we have a different model with different values. Right? Uh, for Southeast Asia, we have to do the same, different areas with different models. For a big tributary, because the tubes are not the same, right? We cannot use the same. We have to calibrate it with our data. Second very important point with the remote sensing data. What you are looking is the surface. You are not looking at the full water column. So the maximum that you can talk about is wash load. Wash load, not suspended load like a pool. Suspended load, a big portion can be sand in suspension that is heterogeneously distributed in the water column. In big rivers, you know that same shape very well. Calibrating how is the distribution of sand into the water column is very tricky. You know, when we use this equation, this stuff, acoustic stuff, it's very complicated to know how we transfer sand in suspension. But sand in suspension in many of the river can be 50%, even more, than the total suspended load. So don't talk about suspended load when using remote sensing. Use about the wash load of surface concentrations because it's not representative of, of the transport for the whole river, water column. And global models are using indistinctly this concept. The same happened when they put, oh, I use a sand data to suspend the sediment concentration from the literature. But they don't explain if this is surface water. If they don't know it's an integrating profile, well, integrating profiles are not useful to calibrate remote sensing. Yeah, I have an integration of the water samples along the, the, the depth of the river, like we use usually sampling in the field, we integrate the water column, is not useful to calibrate uh, surface suspended sediment concentration more. Don't fall into this uh, temptation, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm very tired of getting this in reviews, in paper, even published like that. Uh, okay, that's what my message. Very good uh, comments. Uh, very good comments, Edgardo. We just talked yesterday to students about the necessity of validation for this remote sensing approaches, so you are your comments is going just to straight time. Okay. Excellent. Happy to do that, that you have been uh, highlighting this problem. Okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, but maybe 
quite briefly about the geochemistry and so we will need to uh, finish. Okay, so geochemistry, I, I'm not a specialist in geochemistry, uh, but uh, yeah, there are several studies, mainly the French in the Amazon, is the question, right? Um, that are working mainly with the geochemical uh, aspect of the river. So I, I'm sincerely, uh, I, I, I'm a user of that and this literature, but myself, I'm not working specifically with the water geochemistry. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think for geochemistry, the last two talks for today will be quite relevant for those who are interested in this. Okay, Edgarda, I, I, I really appreciate your talk and we all uh, those who participated in the lecture. So we have a few more questions, but we are quite like in short in time for that. So I, I think we should stop now, but uh, so I think the, the your lecture and recorded lecture will be on the YouTube so people can answer and they can also always ask your contacts to further yeah, our yeah, communication, yeah. I, I hope. Yes, and yeah. thanks a lot again. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot Thank again. You. Got it, so. mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to, to repeat uh, my, my appreciation for the invitation. I've been a very big pleasure to, to participate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we now switched uh, off the translation for a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We're now, we're now will shortly introduce you and then you can start. Yes, you can. Sounds good. Yes, please. Excellent. So dear uh, colleagues, dear participants of our lecture series, it's my great pleasure now to uh, announce the lecture of uh, Professor Nitroyer, who is a very, very big friend of our department working with us on the Baikal Lake for the last uh, already more than five years and uh, very long story of different scientific contacts. 
And uh, but the, his talk would not be about the Baikal Lake, but of his uh, uh, home river. And uh, so any anyway, Jeff, you're welcome. Great. Well, thank thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, Sergey, and to all the organizers. Thank you for inviting me to give a talk today. Uh, I will go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Can 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 we see this, Sergey? Is it uh, this in the laser pointer? It's good. Okay. Yes, laser pointer is good. So we see the screen. All good. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so the talk that I'm going to give today is work that I've done for the past 10 years on the Mississippi River, specifically the lowermost Mississippi River. And it's been a study to try to combine hydrodynamics and sediment transport measurements to inform and validate numerical modeling efforts to better understand about the timing and magnitude of sediment flux within the lowermost Mississippi River. So the portion of the river that is connected to its downstream delta in the Gulf of Mexico. And besides just the, the, the interest scientifically with this work, what we want to do for an applied purpose is to better constrain how we can inform ideas about using river water and sediment to divert from the channel itself to mitigate against coastal wetland loss. That is to move water and sediment into the remaining wetlands and allow for the deposition of those materials and allow to prevent there to be such massive erosion of the Mississippi Delta. And I will touch upon all these concepts in today's talk. So that's a very broad overview. So generally speaking, in a very broad sense, why do we care about research on large river sedimentology and deltaic geomorphology? The first is that river deltas are incredibly dynamic systems. River deltas build and destroy hundreds of square kilometers of land per century, and they have vertical movement rates, for example, subsidence or deposition, that rival any region on Earth's surface, and that includes tectonically active regions where we might expect there to be significant mountain building. While mountains build vertically and shed or denude, river deltas also build vertically in terms of their deposition, and they subside with subsidence rates that are higher than most other locations on Earth's surface. They're geologically important. Studies of modern fluvial deltaic systems provide insights for interpreting ancient depositional systems through their stratigraphy. For example, through the stratigraphic lens, we can ask questions about how Earth's climate and its surface systems like rivers and deltas responded to large climate excursions or perturbations in Earth's history. So we can use insights of studies from modern systems to better inform our stratigraphic interpretations of ancient delta systems. Uh, finally, as I've mentioned already, they're societally relevant. 60%, some 60% of the world's population lives in coastal delta settings. And so there's a strong need to connect sediment transport to land building in order to elucidate how deltas will respond to climate change. In fact, this is the engineering challenge that I would say that our community has for the next century to better understand how we can engineer to protect deltas from subsiding and drowning due to climate change. So a little bit more regionally speaking, the work I'm going to speak to you about today is from the lowermost Mississippi River. And as I've already alluded to, there is a strong need to prevent land loss in the Mississippi Delta. This can be captured based on the satellite picture that you see on the left, which shows the Mississippi River moving into the northern Gulf of Mexico. In the 20th century alone, we lost over 5,000 square kilometers of land. Basically what that is, is deltaic land that's been converted to open water due to a lack of sediment supply and accelerated subsidence of this low-lying landscape. Some predictions have the Mississippi Delta losing up to 13 and a half thousand additional square kilometers of land with just one meter rise of relative sea level, which is expected by the end of the 21st century. So we can see what that picture might look like here for the fate of the Mississippi River Delta if actions aren't taken to better constrain and divert water and sediment as a resource to help mitigate against this land loss. 
this outcome would be catastrophic to the United States as well as to the world. For example, the port of Louisiana, which essentially is here in this region of the Mississippi Delta, is the largest shipping port in the Western Hemisphere by volume of materials traded. 45% of all wetlands in the lower 48 states of the United States reside in Louisiana. It's an extremely important energy sector for the United States economy. There's big oil and gas exploration on the Delta, as well as petrochemical refining. And this is actually home to a unique and eclectic culture of people that have settled this area for many centuries. And indeed, if we look at rivers and deltas in particular around the world, what we find is that they are home to some of the oldest civilizations. So protecting these areas is of critical importance to protecting our cultural legacies around the world. So what we know about engineered diversions of water and sediment is that they really require to tap into the sand load of these large rivers. You may ask, why do we focus our attention on sand when sand may comprise only 10 to 15 percent of the total sediment load of the river, so it's small compared to the mud that's moving through. Well, in order to use sediment to build uh, wetlands and buffer against wetland loss, sand is necessary in so far that it provides up to 70% of burgeoning or juvenile or young delta vol uh, sediment volume. Sand essentially deposits and creates a stable substrate upon which colonization of vegetation can take hold. And the colonization of that vegetation further baffles or reduces flow velocity over top of the deposit and allows for enhanced or accelerated deposition of other materials, including mud. So we focus our attention much on sand and understanding its transport through river systems to better constrain how we can divert that sand, make a deposit, and allow that deposit to feed to other deposit as well. Again, we're going to focus our attention to Mississippi River Drainage Basin, just taking a step back to provide you with an overview of what it looks like. This is it outlined in white here for the lower 48 states of the United States. You can see it extends up into portions of Canada here north of the border. It covers 12% of all North America and is the third largest drainage basin in the world. In terms of water and sediment discharge, the Mississippi River ranks seventh largest in the world. I'll focus your attention on this red box. This is the region of the lowermost Mississippi River where many of the science studies that I present to you today were collected from. This is a satellite image of the lower Mississippi River extending from its, the old river control structure up here, approximately 500 kilometers upstream of the outlet. If you see RK, that simply stands for river kilometers and it's measured in distance above the outlet here at Head of Passes. So you can see that the delta region essentially starts 500 kilometers upstream of the outlet here. We can progress to the south and southeast down the main stem Mississippi River. You can see it turns to the primarily east here, goes past the large city of New Orleans, and then eventually makes a southeastward turn where it has a relatively straight reach, building its classic bird's foot delta into the Gulf of Mexico. In this entire region that you see here, is part of the Holocene aged Mississippi Delta deposit. So just a little bit of background on what it is that we actually do to make the measurements that I'm going to show you for the rest of this talk. We have small boats like the one you see here. This is the RV Itasca. It's approximately eight meters in length. You can see it has a forward dry cabin here. We have all kinds of instrumentation that are put on this boat the most important of which is a multi-beam sonar system. It's a high resolution bathymetric measuring device. It's actually located right here. When we put it into the water, the multi-beam simply lowers on this pole. As this pole rises up, the multi-beam system lowers into the water. We also have a side scan sonar to delineate various sediment compositions on the channel bed. We have a chirp seismic system that allows us to penetrate into the subsurface to understand the underlying strata of the deposits on the bed. We have direct sampling methods by which we can grab uh, sand and sediment off of the channel bed, as well as take gravity or viber cores. We can directly sample the water column using a, uh, a device that's lowered to targeted depths in the water column. Uh, and what we do is we essentially look at what the 
concentration and grain size distribution of sediments and suspension are. And we can measure water column velocity using an ADCP device. And the ADCP for this particular sur survey boat is mounted on the bow right here. So you can see essentially within this eight meter boat, we have contained many devices that we can use to sample the river itself. So to give you a sense of what multi-beam data or the bathymetry of the Mississippi River looks like, I've included this slide here, which shows channel morphology near the city of New Orleans for two distinct discharge conditions. The first is a low discharge condition at 6,500 cubic meters per second, you can see here. So this may seem like a, a big number for those of you that perhaps are familiar with, with smaller river systems. For the Mississippi, however, this is a relatively low discharge case. For high discharge case, the 35,000 cubic meters per second, what you can see is that for the same reach of river here, we have a whole scale or complete change in the bed morphology. So here, during the low discharge case, we have small dunes that are about less than one meter in height, maybe half a meter to one meter in height, and in wavelength are 20 to 30 meters. In flood discharge conditions, what we do is trade out numerous small dunes for few but very large dunes. And these dunes have wavelengths on the order of one to 200 meters and heights on the order of up to 10 meters. Now, what I'll do is draw your attention to the bend segment of this particular reach of river that we surveyed. In both conditions, in both cases, you can see there's seemingly this point where the dunes disappear right here. And for this case, during low discharge, it exists right here. And within the deep bend section of this river, what you find is a channel bed that's completely devoid of sand and indeed dunes, dunes themselves. So what this says is that the translation of the sand moving through this part of the river must occur by way of both migration of these dunes as they slowly but surely push their way downstream as well as suspension of the material. What we're hypothesizing here is that this cutoff right here is due to some limit by which the dunes can no longer remain stable and the sand must be suspended and carried through this bend segment as a part of suspended load transport. So we have two different modes of transport of the sand by both bed forms and suspension. And we're gonna look in greater detail about how this occurs throughout the rest of this talk. But what I'd like to do now is take a step back and show you how divergent these optics are or these, view, it's, these views of the Mississippi are compared to how we traditionally view lowland river systems as understood by geomorphology community from the past several decades. So for example, there's classic studies by Saucier and Walker from the 1980s and 1990s that show that large lowland fluvial systems such as the Mississippi River are essentially built out of their own alluvial sandy material and that the channel bed should be comprised almost entirely of sand. Now, while you may have divergences in the grain size of the material that occupies that bed in association with spatially variable hydrodynamic stress conditions, for example, moving into an outer bend segment here of, of the river meander, you nevertheless completely cover the bed with sandy material that's made available from upstream within the catchment of the river system. And in fact, if we think about how these deposits associated with large lowland rivers are reflected in the stratigraphic record, we might see something like what Walker produced here in 1984, which is a vertical succession of stratigraphy that essentially shows sand, perhaps with some mud, but nevertheless complete sand. The point I'm trying to make here is that by traditional viewpoint of geomorphology, lowland rivers have a bed that's entirely covered by sand. There's a balance between local flow stress and bed sediment grain size. And the uniqueness of the lower Mississippi River as I showed to you in the previous slide, is that we have some sort of composition of eroding substratum in limited alluvial cover or the traditional sand that we'd expect to find in a river system. So just to emphasize that point a little bit more, I've included here some additional um, multi-beam survey images that show what the composition of the bed looks like. This particular segment of the river comes adjacent to the French Quarter in the city of New Orleans. The direction of flow is from the bottom to the top before it makes a right-hand turn here. And what I've done is outline the limit of alluvial sand cover based on this black dashed line here. 
And as again, as we move into this deep segment, what we find is eroding channel bed substrate in the deep section of this bend right here, up to 70 meters deep, but no alluvial cover. So what we see is that in this relatively tight bend segment, there's absolutely no sand to speak of bank to bank across this particular part of the river. It's a little bit different in what I call subtle bend sections of the river, where instead of having a sharp bend, we have a bend nevertheless, but we still have a mixture of alluvial cover with eroding substratum. And this comes from a different segment of the Mississippi River, a little bit upstream from the section that I just showed you, where here flow is moving from left to right, um, as you can see with this arrow here. And what we have is a composition of an alluvial sandbar, a point bar here, and channel bottom substrate exposed underneath the thalweg of this particular part of the river. So what we have then is a composition of both sand and substrate exposed in these subtle bend segments. Now, if we go to what we call a thalweg cross, that is where the thalweg is pushed from one bank line to another bank line due to two opposing bend segments in the river, you can see here moving from the left bank to the right bank in this case, we have complete alluvial cover of sandy sediment across the bed. So in this particular circumstance, we don't expose any of the underlying substrate, but instead have dunes that mantle the bed bank to bank. Okay, we can put these observations together in a more quantitative framework. And I've done so in this particular plot here, which shows radius of curvature for the various segments of the Mississippi River progressing downstream across the lower 165 kilometers of the river system itself. So just to reference you again, river kilometer zero references the outlet of the Mississippi River. New Orleans is situated here at about river kilometer 160. And what we find is that as our radius of curvature decreases, as you can see these different segments moving down here, we find that they are actually typified by channel bed substrate exposed bank to bank. whereas if we have a bend segment, but it doesn't have a significantly high radius of curvature, as shown by these, indicated by these triangles here, what we find is a channel bed with a mixture of substrate and alluvial cover. And in fact, where we have straight reach segments with a thalway cross, as I showed you in the previous slide, what we find here are dunes that are mantled on the bed bank to bank. So we can actually quantify what the distribution is of the various cover of the Mississippi River specifically its substrate versus the sandy bed forms. We can also use a plot to demonstrate that we can actually calculate based on radius of curvature and channel depth, what the composition of the channel bed would look like. So a lower radius of curvature and um, a deeper bed itself actually produces these very tight bend segments without any sediment composition, I'm sorry, without any sandy sediment composition on the channel bed. Whereas if we lower the depth and increase radius of curvature, we can have bend segments that have a mixture, and eventually we can go into segments of the Thalway Cross that are relatively shallow with a high radius of curvature that show here we have complete alluvial coverage. This is a powerful tool because it allows us to use river plan form alone to evaluate both flow depth and the composition of the sediment on the channel bed of the Mississippi River. I would just like to make one comment about the erosion of the substrate of the Mississippi River. We can go through in detail and document the morphology of these erosional features, as I've shown you in these multi-beam snapshots here. And we can measure their aspect ratios, specifically their width versus their length. And if we look, for example, at flute length or flute amplitude versus flute width, what we find for the Mississippi River as plotted here in these two particular um, uh, data plots here, is that they fall directly on a nice one-to-one -one line that was produced by erosional flutes that we find um, in, in um, experiments by a seminal study by J.R.L. Allen in 1971. So in fact, we see that the eroding substrate of the Mississippi River, as you can see here, at least the amplitude and and, and length of these particular erosional features nicely matches those that are traditionally assigned to bedrock channels itself that, as I mentioned, J.R.L. Allen showed in 1971. So essentially these erosional features geometrically match 
the sorts of flutes and potholes that we observe in upland bedrock streams and flume experiments. So what we find for the lowermost Mississippi River is that its channel is entrenched into and confined by steep sidewall substratum. The channel bed com is comprised of a patchwork of relatively thin sand deposits and eroding, eroding substratum. And the sidewall and channel bottom substratum effectively lock the channel plan form in place. In essence, this substratum behaves as a surrogate bedrock for the Mississippi River. And if we look at the distribution of sand versus this substratum here for large portions of the Mississippi River, what we find is that the lower Mississippi River can actually be qualified as a mixed bedrock alluvial river based on the fact that it's essentially eroding into this ancient substratum. This raises a key question. Why, in one of the world's largest river basins, do we seemingly have a lack of sand to cover the entire channel bed of the Mississippi River? So the question then is, why is sand cover so spatially limited in the lowermost Mississippi River? And I'll give you a hint. Bed load flux is not enough to account for this observation because bed load flux alone is sufficient to cover the bed with two to five centimeters of sand per year. So over years or decades or even centuries, one should expect there to be plenty of bed load sediment flux to cover the channel bed with sediment. What I'll, what I'll suggest is that it's related to the style of sediment transport, its timing and magnitude. And to give you a sense of what I mean by that, what I've done here is plotted sediment transport as measured by way of bed form flux versus water discharge on the y-axis here. You can see a regression line fit to the measurements that are shown as these blue um, triangles that you see here. And what we find as shown in this log scale on the y-axis is that there's a hundred fold increase in bed load flux for the Mississippi River for only a five to six fold increase in water discharge. So this is remarkable, right? This, what this shows is that sediment flux increases by two orders of magnitude, a factor of a hundred for simply just a, a four to five fold increase in water discharge. To give you a sense of how divergent this change in sediment flux is for the lower Mississippi River, what I'd like to do is show you the measured bed material discharge for two very small tributary systems in the broader Mississippi River catchment, the North Loop River and the Niobrara River here, which have water discharges significantly smaller than the Mississippi River. But what we find during low discharge for the Mississippi River, at least in terms of bed material transport, are comparable numbers in terms of volume per unit time. Whereas the water discharge might be a thousand times higher than what we find for the lower Mississippi River, nevertheless, the bed material fluxes are quite similar. Whereas if we go to a high discharge case for the Mississippi River, so for example, from 6,000 cubic meters to 34,000 cubic meters, what we find is approximately 100 fold increase in sediment discharge, as I showed you from the previous slide. So this motivates two questions that we're gonna talk about in the ensuing portions of this talk. Why does sediment transport in the Mississippi River vary by two orders of magnitude in time? And can we link this transport variability to a mixed bedrock alluvial channel? And for that, to answer those questions, we're gonna go out and collect detailed measurements of water flow and sediment flux within the lower Mississippi River. We're gonna use targeted field studies to measure local sand transport variability and characterize the time change of the bed flow stress. The data sets we're gonna acquire are bed load transport rates, suspended bed sediment concentration, and water velocity profiles over two water discharge conditions, January and April of 2008 where we have a moderate discharge in January of 11,000 cubic meters per second and a flood discharge in April of 38,000 cubic meters per second. The reach that we're gonna be working in is down here called the Empire Reach, just downstream of the city of New Orleans. And here's a picture of our boat, the research vessel Itasca, and myself and a colleague here deploying a water sampler into the river itself. Okay, the point, that we're trying to get after with these detailed measurements is to use these field data with physical models to evaluate how boundary stress changes in the lower Mississippi River. To give you a sense 
of the basic relationships that we're going to be dealing with, we're going to relate boundary stress, tau B here, with its classic depth slope product, which looks at the density of the fluid times gravity acceleration times depth times slope of the system itself here. We can also relate boundary stress to the shear velocity through its, the, through its square times the density of the fluid. The shear velocity in turn can be related to the mean flow velocity as shown in this relationship here times some sort of friction coefficient. Another important factor that we're gonna look at is the skin friction shear stress shown as this tau sub SF here, which is related to the boundary stress as we showed in these two relationships here, minus the stress that's extracted from the flow due to form drag. Now form drag in rivers traditionally consists of bars and dune forms, which essentially exert friction on the flow and therefore create form drag. In essence, you're extracting from the boundary stress some portion of the stress that is consumed in form drag and whatever's left behind, the skin friction stress is what's made available to move sediment. So first thing we're gonna do is look at bed load sediment transport in the lower Mississippi River. And the way we get after this is by using time iterative measurements of bed bathymetry as shown in this particular plot, which differences two sequential multi-beam snapshots of the Mississippi River and differences them to understand how bed elevation has changed with evolution of the dune form field, essentially the migration of the dunes themselves. So what you see in red here is deposition on the channel bed and green here is erosion of the channel bed in association with the downstream translation of these dunes. Now in a balanced or equilibrated world, we would expect there to be equal erosion for deposition. And in most cases we find that. But in any case, what we can do is take these measurements for volume change and use them to calculate a sediment flux, put that sediment flux into a traditional sediment flux bed form algorithm as shown here, and essentially invert this formulation here to calculate the shear velocity and use that shear velocity to calculate the shear stress. And what we find after using a number of transport formula is that we have a stress that ranges between about one and 1.5 for low discharge and between about 7.9 and 14 pascals for high discharge. Now, another data set that we can use to determine information about shear stress are actually the suspended sand or bed material profiles. And what this plot here is showing you is distance above the channel bed in meters. So you can see it's a rather deep uh, portion of the river here at 30 meters versus volumetric sand concentration. So these black squares here represent all sand data, whereas these open triangles here represent sand greater than 200 microns. We can fit these data with a Rousean profile, a Rouse model that's shown here, where the Rouse model is tuned by this P parameter. This P is the Rouse number, which essentially relates settling velocity of the particle, which is a primarily a function of the size of the particle to shear velocity of the flow shown here as U star F. And by tuning this model to the data sets, we can back out or extract what the stress conditions are to give these profiles. And what we find is that during high discharge, we have up to 7.4 pascals. And during low discharge, we have something between 4.8 pascals. Another data set that we can use to further constrain stress conditions in the Mississippi River are the flow velocity data. Those are produced from our ADCP, Acoustic Doppler Current Profiler measuring device. And what we find in this particular plot is distance above the bed on the y-axis with respect to the flow velocity on the x-axis here. And you can see the data are fit here. And again, we can fit a model, a theoretical velocity profile model to the data here. In this case, we use what we call a law of the wall theoretical velocity profile, which relates velocity u for a given depth z through this u star here, which again is the shear velocity. And by tuning this particular model to our data, we can invert the profile to calculate what the shear velocity is, and then use that shear velocity to calculate boundary stress. In fact, when we do that with our velocity profiles, we get numbers that are very similar to what we calculated using our Rousean model, which I showed you in the previous slide, 
and our bed form transport models, which I showed you two slides ago. So if we summarize the skin friction shear stress conditions for the Mississippi River, what we find is that we have from low discharge to flood discharge, about an eight times increase. We can do some sensitivity analysis and show that that increase from low to high discharge is probably anywhere between about five to 13. So in general, we call it a tenfold increase in transport stress from low to high discharge. Now, what this means for sediment flux, as I've already pointed out, is that we go from something very minimally small, 86 tons per hour, to something exceptionally large during flood discharge conditions, which is over 10,000 tons per hour. So what we find here is this condition of punctuated sand transport in lowermost Mississippi River, where for during low discharge conditions, there's very limited to almost nil movement, whereas during high discharge conditions, there's a significant enhancement or augmentation in the sediment flux. The key points here is that sand transport increases by a factor of 100, two orders of magnitude, due to this tenfold change in boundary stress. Furthermore, this range in boundary shear stress conditions is not possible for reach average uniform flow conditions, what we call normal flow, which may be characterized by the depth slope product as shown here. So what we find is that there must be a condition of non-uniform flow in the lowermost Mississippi River that's giving rise to the significant variation in stress as well as sediment flux conditions. So we're gonna explore that in the next few slides. What we find for the Mississippi River is that instead of having uniform flow conditions, we actually have what we call a backwater flow in the Mississippi River. To get a sense of what backwater flow is, I'd like to show this particular plot which shows elevation above mean sea level indicated as zero here. Distance above head of passes of the outlet of the river shown moving from, up, um, from downstream to upstream, left to right across the x-axis here, and a series of profiles here. So this is high water discharge, air water interface. So the water surface during high water discharge and the water surface during low water discharge. The profiles that you see here are the channel bed profiles. This A to T is the Thalweg profile that you can see progressing downstream. And A to 60 is just the 60th percentile depth. So something that's just slightly deeper than the 50th or the median depth profile of the channel bed itself. What you can tell though from this particular plot is that the water surface elevation profile of the Mississippi River asymptotically approaches sea level at the river outlet. Furthermore, stage variability, the change in stage between low discharge to high discharge decreases as you move downstream. So what do I mean by that? If we go upstream, say river kilometer 600, what we find is a nearly doubling of water depth between low to flood water discharge. Whereas if we go downstream to within 50, kilometers of the outlet, we can see that the change in water surface elevation, the stage change, is fractional compared to the overall water depth. It might be 5 or 10 percent increase. So you can see that there's this very strong change in how stage actually occurs where stage variation arises in the lower Mississippi River. We can invert those water surface profiles, elevation profiles, to calculate water surface slope to further demonstrate how slope changes between low and high water discharge cases. So this plot here shows water surface slope on the y-axis with respect to distance upstream on the x-axis. What we find for low, moderate, and flood water discharge conditions is a strong variation in slope. I'll point out as well that if we plot bed slope here, what we find is at about river kilometer 600, the bed slope is equal to the water surface slopes across all water discharge conditions. This is a case of uniform flow condition where in fact the bed slope sets the water surface slope, which does not deviate even as a function of water discharge. Whereas if we progress downstream, what we see is a departure of bed slope and water surface slope, and moreover, a significant change in water surface slope progressively going downstream between low to moderate to flood water discharge. In fact, we can, this, this change in hydrodynamic conditions as shown here in the slope is what we characterize as backwater flow. 
That is flow velocity that decreases downstream in a spatial sense. We can calculate what that backwater flow condition looks like simply by looking at a backwater scale. What we can show here is how backwater conditions change for the Mississippi River by using a backwater length scale, LB. This characterizes the flow depth divided by the bed slope itself here. This gives us a characteristic backwater length scale that can actually be used to show where the non-uniform conditions exist in the Mississippi River. So just to bring some summary to what I've been showing you here, what we've been able to demonstrate is non-uniform or backwater flow affects boundary shear stress in the lower 650 kilometers of the Mississippi River. This results in a condition of punctuated sand transport where sand flux varies by two orders of magnitude from low to high water discharge conditions. We can relate this to the condition of a mixed bedrock alluvial channel. And what I'll propose to you here is that the stress in bend segments of the river is sufficiently high to, to locally suspend all the sediments during flood discharge condition so as to essentially carry all the coarse sand as a part of suspended transport, removing it from the bed and exposing the underlying substratum. This brings us to two critical questions here. The first is where is all the missing coarse sediment in the lowermost Mississippi River that would be necessary to fully alleviate the channel bed? And the second is, is how do these hydrodynamic and sediment transport feedbacks influence the development of fluvial deltaic stratigraphy? And that'll be the focus of the remaining remainder of my talk. Now, what I'd like to do here is show you the outcome of some models that we've used to address the first question, which is specifically, where does the coarse sediment actually exist in the lower Mississippi River? And what I've shown you here is a hydrodynamic computation that shows, or excuse me, a, a measurement that shows cross-sectional area with respect to distance above head of passes for low to floodwater discharge. And what we can do is use these data to produce a hydrodynamic computation for what water flow velocity should look like in the lower reaches of the Mississippi River between low, moderate, and floodwater discharge conditions as shown in this plot here. So what we see is this non-uniform flow condition that exists during low discharge where water velocity decreases as we progress downstream. And as we're already aware of, this lowers the sediment transport capacity and limits the amount of sediment flux that's measurable in the Mississippi River. Whereas during floodwater discharge, you can see that we have relatively consistent or uniform water flow velocity that allows for augmented sediment flux in the river system. We can use these hydrodynamic computations for velocity and input them into a bed material transport model and calculate how sediment transport should vary from low to floodwater discharge conditions from the head of passes, the river outlet upstream to where we have uniform flow conditions. And what we can see here is that during low water discharge, we significantly decrease our sediment flux progressing through this non-uniform or backwater flow region. Whereas during high water discharge, because we have significant stress, we can actually maintain sufficiently high velocity and therefore sediment transport throughout the lower reaches of the Mississippi River here. So what we can do is take those data that show sediment transport variations over time and space and use them to make predictions about how the bed elevation would change. This is specifically through what we call an extra model, which shows the time deviation of bed elevation, where eta is elevation and dt here is just change in time, as a consequence of spatial divergences and sediment flux, which are shown as dqs dx here. So if we take the computed sediment transport over time and space that I showed you in the previous slide, and use that information to calculate bed elevation change, we produce the plot that we see here on the left, which shows predicted annual change in bed elevation with respect to distance upstream of the, of the outlet at head of passes. So if it were to be an equilibrium condition where we have nil deposition or erosion, it would be zero here. Whereas in areas where we actually have positive dep um, uh, calculations, we show deposition, in areas where we have negative calculations, we show erosion. And I'd like to point out that this portion where the model predicts erosion 
coincides with where we made observations that show limited sandy alluvial cover and the bedrock, the exposure of the underlying bedrock substratum for the Mississippi River. So in fact, this model is corroborated by our observations that indicate that there is a limit on sediment uh, cover on the, on the bed. Furthermore, this model predicts between river kilometer 300 to 600 that we should have a big wedge of sediment deposit here. So we have aggradation where we have this normal flow to backwater transition. So I'd like to pose a question of what the morphological consequences are long-term for this point or this region of aggradation associated with this transition from normal flow to backwater flow or from uniform to non-uniform flow. To give you a sense of what that looks like from a planform perspective, here's a map of the state of Louisiana. The Mississippi Delta again is shown here. And river kilometer 300 or so upstream to 600 is shown in this yellow box here. So this is in fact is the region where we'd expect there to be aggradation associated with this non-uniform flow condition. What we find is for that particular part of the river is a number of Holocene avulsions. So we've had five to seven significant Holocene avulsion points for the Mississippi River. It is where avulsion is where the river catastrophically changes course and moves to a new channel and a new build starts building a new lobe on the delta system overall. And what we find for that region of predicted channel bed aggradation is the nodal point for many avulsions that have occurred over the Holocene. And what we know based on some very standard studies that have been produced in the last 20 years is the first order control in avulsions is the super elevation of the channel bed with respect to the surrounding floodplain. And one would expect there to be super elevation of the channel bed in a region where we have aggradation, such as the non-uniform to uniform transition of the Mississippi River. Secondly, it turns out that the Mississippi River has highly variable lateral migration rates, as is shown in this particular plot here, which shows lateral migration with respect to distance above head of passes at the outlet. So what we find here, for example, is that from river kilometer, say 700 up to 1700, we have relatively consistent lateral migration. Whereas we have enhanced lateral migration right here, at river kilometer 500 to about seven or 800, and then essentially nil lateral migration in the lower couple hundred kilometers. And what our community knows about lateral mobility for river channels is this controlled by two factors. The first is development of channel bars, and the second is the strength, the integrity of the, of the bank line system itself. Both the development of channel bars and lowering of bank strength will lead to enhanced lateral migration. And we know that to be the case in rivers that are net deposition of sandy material, which both builds the bar and is incorporated into the floodplain so as to limit the bank strength of the floodplain material itself. So we expect there then to be enhanced lateral mobility in regions where we actually find channel bed aggradation such as the uniform to non-uniform or backwater transition of the lower Mississippi River. So what I'd like to do then is propose to you what's happening here is essentially that in this cartoon, as we can see in this cartoon, as we progress downstream to the outlet of the Gulf of Mexico, we have a low water surface profile that asymptotically approaches the elevation of the Gulf of Mexico. This reduces shear stress by lowering velocity which results in the deposition of coarse sediment to the channel bed that seemingly never makes its way downstream to the outlet of the river. So we see decreasing sediment transport capacity drives deposition of coarse bed material to the bed and essentially creates a migratory or transient prograding coarse grain sediment wedge within the channel of the Mississippi River. The question is, can we actually find this migrating coarse grain sediment wedge? And what I'll do to get us dialed into that is show you once again the actual channel bed profiles of the Mississippi River with respect to the water surface profiles. What we can do is regress the data as you see here to show that the channel bed slopes are relatively constant at nine times 10 to the minus five until we hit river kilometer approximately 270 right here. And then essentially in our bedrock reach, we lower the slope of the channel by a factor of nine, as you can see here, comparing the bedrock river slope to the upstream slope, 
there's about a factor of nine difference. In fact, in that region, we can also see decreasing grain size of the sediment material on the bed as we see there. That is, the coarse material is seemingly caught in the upstream uniform to non-uniform tra transition, and that the bed quickly finds as we progress downstream with sediment or sand that's capable of getting past this non-uniform flow condition, but nevertheless is fine enough that when it gets into bend segments with local enhanced shear velocity due to the bend itself can be propelled into suspension. In essence, this backwater filters coarse grain sediment and limits its mobility in the lower Mississippi River. Now for the final part of the talk, what I'd like to do is describe how we can apply this information about the time and magnitude variability of sand flux in the Mississippi River to inform about engineering designs that would divert water and sediment from the river to locate it to places in the delta that require this material in order to mitigate against wetland loss. Now, what I'll propose to you is that we need to constrain local conditions when using models to better understand how we can divert water and sediment to mitigate land loss. A classic example of this statement is shown by a very nice paper by Wan Suk Kim published in 2009, which tries to model two diversions on either side of the Mississippi River Delta lobe, as you see here, to build land itself into the adjacent wetlands in order to buffer against storm waves that would otherwise attack the society that lives within this part of the river delta itself here. So we need local conditions. We need constraints on the local conditions of timing and magnitude of sand movement in order to better constrain the engineering design of these particular diversions. So what I'm gonna show you is a study that we proposed for what we call the Bonnie Carey Spillway, which is located right where this yellow box is, just about 100 kilometers upstream of the city of New Orleans. Now, to give you a sense of background for what this spillway actually is, it's a part of the river where the levee can be removed to allow for flood water to evacuate across the landscape before entering Lake Pontchartrain. The idea behind the spillway structure is to prevent there to be high stages downstream at the city of New Orleans that would threaten the levees on the city of New Orleans. So the idea is to create a removable levee, a spillway structure that evacuates water from the river and flows into Lake Pontchartrain. What we had the opportunity to do was go study the spillway structure when it was opened during an enormous flood in the year of 2011. This happened to be the largest flood on record since the great flood of 1927. It was a three month long flood and it necessitated opening this emergency spillway structure here in order to evacuate water from the river. Now, just to give you a little bit of close up for what the spillway actually looks like, this is the Mississippi River, as you can see here, color coded with its depth as it flows past the spillway structure that you see here. The red here are guide levees that allow for water to flow out of the river across the landscape and enter into Lake Pontchartrain, which exists right here. We can look at cross-sectional profiles from A to A prime and B to B prime to get a better sense for how the spillway operates. That's shown in these blue and red lines here, respectively. What we find is the main portion of the channel exists here. At low water discharge conditions, the elevation or the stage itself here is contained within this entire portion of the channel. But during flood flows, we actually elevate that stage and allow that stage to flood back across the forebay, which is shown in red and orange here, and essentially buttress up against the spillway. Now it's this spillway here that is the removable levee. We can get a sense for what that looks like in this particular photograph that I show in the lower left column here, which essentially shows me standing next to these spillway structures, these wood boards that can be removed by a crane that operates on top of a railroad track that exists above here. And what you can do is allow water to flow out of these particular areas. A photograph here is taken from an airplane by myself during an opening in 2011, and essentially shows how the forebay or the region adjacent to these removable levees is open, allowing water to spill into the spillway and flow across into Lake Pontchartrain itself here. I should point out, this can remove a significant volume of water, 
something like 6,000 cubic meters per second, which is a tremendous amount of water um, just overall. But you know, compared to the flood discharge of the Mississippi, might represent 10 to 20 percent of the total water coming downstream. Now, what we had the opportunity to do in our study of the 2011 opening was to wait for the flood wave to uh, rescind, for the water to dry out in the spillway, and go out and collect aerial images of the spillway itself. So to give you a point of reference here, this is the Mississippi River. It flows from right to left across your screen here. This is the spillway structure right here. So that's the removable levee. And what you find here are significant sand deposits associated with the removal of sediment-laden water from the river into, into the spillway structure, as you see here. In fact, these sand deposits are worked up into trains of dunes, as you can see here. And in fact, they're quite large in size. For example, here's a field assistant standing in the crest of one of, or I'm sorry, in the trough of one of these dunes with its crest back up around him. And to give you a sense of size, he's about two meters in height. So you can see that these dunes that are being built by the sand leaving the river into the spillway are quite large. Now, interestingly enough, if we look at the, the, the um, sample size, the grain size of the sand that's making its way out of, the spill, uh, out of the river and depositing in the spillway, what we find is that it's essentially equivalent to the river uh, sand that we find in the channel bed adjacent to the spillway. In essence, what we have is a perfect matching between the sand that's in the river channel and the sand that's depositing in the spillway. And one could expect this, right? That the source of sand is the same and therefore their grain sizes match. And in fact, that's what we find. What we did is go through and actually calculate the spatial distribution of all the sand within the spillway and its measured thickness to calculate what the total volume of sand is that was this posit in the spillway, namely multiplying its total area times its depth in order to get the, vol the measured volume of sand. And we come up with a number during the 2011 event of about 4.9 million cubic meters of sand. What we're gonna do is compare that, that, that um, uh, measurement of sand to a calculation of how much sand we should expect to deposit in the spillway just based on the concentration and volume of water and sand evacuating the spillway. So it's a very simple model where we predict the volume of sand by multiplying the sand concentration times total water volume times the time period of spillway opening and multiplying by a factor that corrects for its concentration. And due to lack of time, I won't go into the details of this model, but what we find is that essentially the predicted volume of sand is about 5.1 million cubic meters, which essentially matches what we produced before, uh, that is for our measurement. So what I wanna show you here is that we can actually get a very good handle on how these spillways are actually predicted to evacuate sand based on measurement versus observation and modeling framework to calculate the amount of sand that one should expect to leave the spillway structure. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just conclude here um, and then take your questions. And what I'll argue is that to accurately predict sand discharge from engineered diversions of any river, we need to have control on the local suspended sediment concentration. There's a significant amount of coarse sediment that can be routed through engineering diversions and used for land building. And I'll further emphasize that sand load is imperative to di divert because it's this sediment that provides a stable substrate upon which vegetation colonizes, which then limits water velocity and leads to further deposition of sediment, including fine muds. Okay, so I'll end my talk there. And, um, and I'd be happy to open the, the discussion for any questions that we have in, in the next few minutes. But thank you for your attention. Great, thank you a lot, Jeff. It's, as always, your lecture is something very fundamental and outstanding. Uh, so very valuable and uh, reasonable for, for young scientists to see this sort of uh, talk. So thanks a lot. Uh, so we have uh, not big time uh, left, but so I will start with the questions. And the question first comes from a student of hydrology department, uh, Ekaterina Krastin. 
So the question is, how does river engineering and channel modification affect the sediment transport in Lowermost, Mississippi? Yeah, so this is a, a very interesting question. Um, I am now a part of a study that is actually working at a part of the river upstream from where I was talking about today at what we call the Old River Diversion Complex, which actually takes water and sediment from the main Mississippi River Channel and pushes it into the Atchafalaya River Basin, which is just to the west. And it turns out that the diversion of water and sediment from there actually lends to channel bed aggregation of sediment. So in this particular circumstance, what we find is that diverting water without diverting an appropriate amount of sediment will lend to sediment deposition in the channel bed itself. So it's a very good point that's made here is that anytime we engineer with the river, including diversions, we must take into account the fact that we're lowering the transport capacity by removing water and must remove an equivalent amount of coarse material. Otherwise, we'll lend to deposition, which can otherwise alter the, the, the dynamics of the river system. Okay, so uh, then uh, the, the, the another question is from the Plymouth University, uh, from the uh, recent geography graduate, Lewis Hill. So the question is, the idea of backwater being a filter of coarse sediments is very interesting. Does this directly influence rate of fine sediment transport? Oh, that's a very good question. I've never actually thought about that question. Um, I don't know. My, my intuition says perhaps no, but it would be a very interesting modeling exercise to see about how we would expect the rate of fine grain sediment to change as a function of removing the coarse sediment from the sediment load. So that, that's a very good idea. I, I've never heard of anyone pursuing this problem before, um, but I think through some simple model calculations, we might be able to get at an answer. Okay, and so, so maybe just briefly, Jeff, what is this great flood of 1927? So I mean, maybe make this question for general uh, knowledge. Uh, compared to 2011, what's how they differed? What was about magnitude? What was larger? Right. So the 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 so it's an interesting question. The, the 1927 flood was actually larger in terms of water volume. However, the stages throughout the Mississippi River were larger during 2011. And this has to do okay. with the fact that there was this, there, well, you know, in the intervening 80 or 90 years, there was deposition of bed material sediment on the channel bed, which in essence was occupying part of the okay. bed, enhanced or elevated the stages uh, for the river discharge. So higher stages for 2011, but slightly lower water than 1927. Okay, okay, oh, it's interesting. It's uh, sometimes we have uh, in Russia the uh, magnitudes of the floods which were in the beginning of the century now is not even possible in this south region to imagine because the, the, the winters are disappeared and that's uh, what we have in 1917, for example, like the large flood in this area was happened now it's can't even impossible to imagine the, the similar discharge at all so just okay so we uh, we have to stop here the it's uh, this level so due to timing and so uh, thanks a lot professor Nitroyer, for my pleasure talk. thank you and very questions okay so we will stop translation for one, two minutes just to... Mm -hmm.
Da. Uh, I'm trying to share uh, my screen. Does it work? Yes, and I will briefly introduce you. So the, the third speaker for today is uh, Professor Dr. Daniel Katze. Uh, so it, from beginning of November now, he represents the uh, United Nations University. And he came back to Germany after being a professor in Mongolia, in German Mongolian University. And also it's a pleasure to always to introduce uh, Daniel on the some sort of Moscow State University seminars or lectures, as far as he's a very big friend also for our department with long mutual history of very big collaborative research. And his talk will go to the area where many scientists meet together to do the Stellinga Basin. So, and I give the floor to Daniel, uh, please. Very welcome and thanks you find time to make a lecture here. Thank you very much for the introduction, um, Sergey. I think we now look back to 10 years of, of um, collaboration. My topic today will be um, water quality problems in the Mongolian sub-basins of the Selenga, a nexus perspective. And uh, very first, I would briefly like to introduce myself. I'm currently the head of the research program, Resource Nexus for Regions in Transformation at uh, the United Nations University, which has um, campuses in several different countries, including Germany, where our focus is on um, integrated management um, of matter fluxes and of resources. Previously, I served for the German Mongolian Institute for Resources and Technology for three and a half years, and prior to that, um, seven years at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research. And um, some of the work that I'm presenting today actually goes back to um, the work with these two institutions as well. So um, very firstly, I would like to introduce you to the resource nexus concept, um, which is um, a fundamental concept that underlies all the work that we do at um, UNU Flores, my institute. Um, I will give a very brief introduction into the Selenga River, Lake Baikal Basin. And then um, in a second larger chapter, um, I will take a look at uh, how to apply the resource nexus for the basin of the Selenga and Lake Baikal. Um, I will uh, firstly give a short introduction into mining and um, the upper in the upper um, Selenga Basin. I will then look at raw materials, water and soil and the connections um, between these elements. And then in the second step, look at food security, water and soil, for which you will see there will then also be some links to um, the um, previous considerations looking at um, raw materials. Finally, um, I will summarize some of the findings and um, discuss some key linkages. So firstly, um, the resource nexus um, is an approach um, to um, looking at multiple environmental resources, looking at the interrelations between different resources, the interdependencies between um, environmental resources, but also their transitions and fluxes across um, spatial scales and um, between compartments. And basically, the resource nexus considers um, environmental resources as a complex system where we need to consider um, different resources, not in isolation, but um, in an integrated way. And the resource nexus concept was actually first introduced um, in the year 2011 at the so-called Bonn Nexus um, Conference. And back then, the key focus was actually on water, food, and ener uh, energy security. And the concept of the resource nexus during the past 10 years um, has evolved, um, adding um, additional perspectives to the nexus. One example is the so-called water, waste, and soil nexus. And today, preferably, we speak of the resource nexus that is um, even more integrated, looking at an integration of biotic and abiotic resources, but also at waste and energy. Now, when we look at um, the resource nexus, um, here you can see the elements water, food, energy, materials, and land resources. 
these different nexus elements are connected to each other in multiple ways. And um, these linkages are actually strongly um, connected to the sustainable development goals that were formulated um, by the United Nations. So um, if we look, um, for example, at the connection between um, water and food here, um, you can see that obviously it would be the SDG number two, zero hunger. But we can see also that there would be connections to other SDGs, such as SDG 11, sustainable cities and um, communities, or for example, SDG 15, um, life on land. Now, in this talk, uh, we will be um, taking, taking a look at the Selenga River Lake Baikal Basin. And as I think as Russians, you're all familiar that um, Lake Baikal is um, the world's oldest and by volume, the largest um, freshwater lake, the deepest freshwater lake. And when we look at this lake, we can basically say that um, it depends a lot on what happens in the basin of the Selenga River. So in the black outline on the map, you can see the basin um, of Lake Baikal. And most of that um, is basically um, the network of um, the Selenga River and um, its tributaries. In the end, um, between 50 and 60% of the surface water influx into Baikal depend on um, what is happening in the Selenga River Basin. Now, when we look at um, Lake Baikal, um, it's a lake that has a global relevance. Um, it's recognized, for example, as a World Heritage Site. And one very important part of this lake um, or um, of the Selenga or Baikal Basin is formed by the Selenga Delta, which is um, one of the world's largest inland um, deltas. And it's a wetland of international relevance. So um, the Selenga Delta is, for example, included um, on the International uh, Ramsar um, Convention, um, which deals with the protection of wetlands of international importance. So basically what happens in the Selenga does not only affect Lake Baikal, but also um, the Selenga Delta. Now we will take a look at um, the application of the resource nexus concept um, for um, the Selenga River. And um, the focus here will be the interlinkages between water resources and water quality as um, a central element and its um, connections firstly to the raw material sector, which is of course a consumer, but also a polluter of water. We will look at the connections to soil security and to food security. Now, when we look at um, the mining sector in Mongolia, we can basically state that um, this sector is of, of a very significant um, economic importance. The mining sector contributes about 20% um, to um, Mongolia's um, gross domestic product, about 20% of um, the government budget. If we look at um, foreign direct investment, about 73% of the investments are related to the mining sector, and about 90% of Mongolia's exports um, are produced um, in the mining sector. In the picture that you can see um, on the bottom of this page, you can see an example of one of those mining sites, um, the copper molybdenum mine, um, which operates in the city of Erdenet, that in a few minutes um, we will take um, a closer look at. Now, when we think about um, raw materials um, extraction, and we now focus on um, the Mongolian part of the Selenga River Basin, we can see that um, there is uh, one region that is um, basically located between the national capital of Ulaanbaatar, a little bit um, to the west of it and north of it, um, where we find these red dots which mark mining sites. And basically, when we look at these mining sites um, in um, the Mongolian part of the basin, um, the most important commodities would be copper molybdenum, which I already mentioned for um, the city of Erdenet here. But there is also some um, coal mining activities and um, 
quite some gold mining that is located mostly between um, Ulaanbaatar city and um, the Russian border. Raw materials extraction also takes place in um, the Russian part of the basin where um, molybdenum, tungsten um, and gold are the most important um, commodities. Um, I will now focus on the Mongolian part. So when looking at um, the um, upper Selenga River Basin, basically um, we can state that um, mining is firstly um, a very major water user. At least 80 million cubic meters um, of um, water per year um, are used um, for mining. Some estimates go far higher and state that it's 200 or 300 million um, cubic meters per year. And we can state that uh, approximately um, seven cubic meters of, of water are used um, for um, handling and processing one cubic meter um, of ore. So um, the mining sector is a very major water consumer, but also an important um, polluter of water and soils. And it is a very important um, cause of erosion and land degradation. When looking at mining associated um, pollution in the rivers of northern Mongolia, firstly, we can say that um, increased turbidity is a general um, consequence of the mining operations. So there is um, a sediment input into the river system that is um, related to um, various mining activities. But there are also several trace elements which have been found um, to occur in um, higher concentrations downstream of mining sites. And this includes um, a very long list of elements, including aluminum, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, lead, selenium, uranium, vanadium, zinc. So we can see it's a very long list of elements. And um, some of these elements are actually very toxic and of um, a great importance um, for um, the aquatic um, ecosystem. Now, when um, looking at um, pollution that is caused um, by mining operations, um, on this picture here, we can see um, soil um, pollution along um, the uh, Tool River, which is one of the tributaries that leads towards um, the Orhon and then um, ultimately um, the um, Selenga River in Mongolia. And we can see different elements here, for example, arsenic, iron, zinc, lead, strontium, cadmium. And what is um, notable here is that um, several of these um, elements, when we look at um, soils, are found in um, high concentrations in soils in close proximity um, to the rivers. And um, this is um, actually very often um, related um, to um, mining activities. In the case of the Tool River, this is chiefly gold mining in um, a region called Zama. Now, when we think about um, soil pollution and uh, water pollution, basically we can say that um, there is a relatively strong linkage um, between these two. When we look at um, the sediments um, that we find um, in the river system, um, some colleagues of mine um, did research on um, the identification of um, fine sediment sources using um, geochemical and isotope-based um, fingerprinting techniques. And depending on the location uh, in the river network, um, basically 50 to 90% um, approximately um, of um, the sediments, the fine sediments found in the river system um, originated um, from the river banks. And this basically tells us that um, river pollution from mining um, is a very real threat, um, particularly um, when um, mining operations um, take place very close um, to the river. And this is something that we um, very often find. Um, we will see some examples um, soon. 
Now, when we look at um, the um, transport of elements in the river system, um, we can um, state that um, there are um, some elements which are predominantly transported in suspended form, whereas others are um, predominantly um, transported in dissolved form. Example for um, problematic elements that are transported um, in the suspended form would, for example, be um, nickel or lead. But um, there are other elements um, such as, for example, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, molybdenum, uranium, which are predominantly um, transported in the dissolved form. If you look at um, the table that you can see on the top of this slide, you can see different elements and um, the relative um, share of the element that um, is um, transported um, in a suspended um, form during high water and um, low water periods. Um, so for example, if you look at um, the first one, you can see here um, the um, element of iron, 98% during, during high water periods um, would be um, transported in um, the suspended fraction. If we look um, by contrast to here, um, a low water period, that would be 67%. And um, when looking here at the bottom at areas with a high anthropogenic impact, um, those um, relative percentages are a little bit different. We can see, for example, for iron, that um, it's always um, transported um, very predominantly um, in um, a suspended form. So basically, um, we can see that um, there is a difference between different elements um, regarding um, their main um, fort of transportation in the river system. But um, there is also a very significant impact um, that um, the hydrology has um, on this um, transport. So when we look at the uh, mode of trace element transport, in this case, um, at the Mongolian um, Russian border where the Selenga um, crosses the border, we can see that um, there is a very um, different picture for um, a flood um, period shown on the left side um, of the slide and a low water period um, on the right side. So we can see that um, during the um, flood period, there is um, for many elements um, a dominance of um, suspended transport, which is probably a sign that they were rather newly mobilized and uh, entered um, the river system. Whereas during a low water period, um, this picture looks rather different and um, for most fraction um, is um, the dominant one. So it's um, the fractions of the two um, suspended and dissolved the hydrology, suspended sediment um, concentrations in the basin of the lake. River basin, um, we can see that um, the average suspended um, sediment concentrations in some regions, which are marked in the dark red colors, um, would exceed 250 milligrams per liter whereas in um, other parts of the basin, um, they would be um, far lower. And when we um, think about um, the um, sources of these um, suspended sediments, we can see that um, the largest mining areas um, that we um, can see here, the largest ones which are located um, close um, or just next find um, the highest suspended sediment on Zamar that I mentioned um, already before, um, a gold mining region that is found
proximity um, to um, the Tool River mining, which is actually taking place um, within the river banks. Um, you can see um, on the um, right side um, a picture that um, was a part of a news report um, in Mongolia in 2018. In this case, actually, um, a gold mining company um, that uh, claimed to um, have an ecological process. Um, so they call themselves Eco Gold. Um, and uh, if we see that um, the um, river is in very close um, proximity to the region that they are here preparing um, for the gold mining and preparing for um, flooding, um, we can see that um, even today, um, even though it's in um, theory um, illegal to have uh, mining operations um, within um, the River Rhine floodplains, we can see that um, this is actually still um, reality. Now, when we look at um, the um, pollution um, of um, the river system, um, here we take a look at uh, one specific um, element, um, namely arsenic. And we um, see in this picture here um, the enrichment factors um, in um, relation um, to um, the standards for Mongolia and Russia. And what we can see here is that it's actually um, two um, mining areas. This one here would be um, the Zama gold mining area. This one here would be um, the Erdenet um, copper molybdenum. Um, mining area and we can see that um, these are the two regions where for the element of arsenic um, we find um, the greatest levels um, of enrichment and um, the extreme values we can see here are particularly um, notable um, for um, the Zama region where it's um, 82 times um, the um, levels, um, the standard um, levels. Now we look at uh, the second um, important mining region, um, namely um, the um, Erdenet um, copper molybdenum mine. And when you look um, at this map, you can see here the location um, of the mine itself. You can see um, here the city um, of Erdenet. And um, on the top of the picture, um, you can see um, a tailing pond um, into which um, many of um, the mine tailings um, are deposited. Um, one problem that um, very often occurs is that parts of this um, tailing pond dry up and um, a phenomenon that is locally referred to as white dust um, happens. These are small dust particles which are formed after um, parts of the pond have desiccated and um, the wind then begins to um, transport these fine dust particles. We are in a region where the dominant um, wind direction is winds coming from um, westerly or northwesterly um, direction. And basically this means that um, when we look here at um, this Tailing pond, um, there is a significant risk that um, material that is here, if um, this dust becomes mobilized, um, it can um, be moved towards um, the Hangal River, which in the end um, flows into the Orkhon and then um, the um, Selenga River. And when we look um, at the soils, but also um, the uh, Hangal River, um, several um, priority substances um, could be um, identified. They include um, arsenic, um, which is um, often um, contained um, in the ores, which also contain the um, copper and molybdenum. So um, there is arsenic also in um, the mine tailings from where uh, it can then be mobilized. Um, we find, not surprisingly, copper and molybdenum in um, elevated concentrations um, in the soils, but also um, a few other elements um, that are found in um, elevated concentrations. 
Now, when um, looking at um, water pollution, um, if we detect water pollution with a certain element, um, of course, we need um, initially, we need to assume that there can be different um, origins. Um, the um, pollution may be um, one that is mining related, but um, trace elements could also be of a simple um, geogenic source. So it's very much relevant um, to compare um, the um, situation to the regional natural background levels um, to really reveal if um, the um, pollution is actually related to mining impacts. Um, something that we also find rather often um, in the Mongolian part of the Selenga River Basin is that some mines would um, close down or um, discontinue their operation for some time of the year. So they are not um, operational 12 months a year, but the uh, mining operations tend to concentrate um, on the summer month. And if we see that um, the um, times during which the mines operate lead to a greater pollution level in the river system, this can of course also be interpreted as a sign or um, a mining origin. So we look now once again at um, the example um, of arsenic. And for arsenic, um, we uh, here look at the basin of the Kara River Basin, one of the uh, sub basins um, of the Selenga in Mongolia. And when looking at um, natural um, background concentrations in um, the um, upper catchments that are not affected, um, not impacted by mining or um, any other um, anthropogenic um, activities, we find a natural um, background concentration of arsenic of approximately 1.8 um, micrograms per liter. So anything that we find that would be close to those 1.8 micrograms per liter would have to be considered um, a geogenic um, background concentration. But when we move um, into um, those tributaries where um, the gold mining takes place, we can see that the concentrations increase to um, somewhere between um, 19 and 43 micrograms per liter and in between for the gold mining um, impacted um, sub-basins. The second figure here um, shows the arsenic concentrations um, in um, the um, Kaha River um, just below um, a um, gold mining region. And we can see here the um, range of concentrations um, during um, the summer, winter, and autumn seasons. Um, in this case, um, the uh, seasons uh, summer 2014 and autumn um, 2016, where you can see the red um, asterisk. Um, this refers to um, a situation where um, the mining operation was ongoing. And we can see that in these cases, um, we saw um, concentrations reaching up to um, 25, 26 um, micrograms per liter. Whereas at a time when um, the mining operation was paused, um, the concentrations were lower and um, the highest ever um, detected um, arsenic concentration was um, about 14 micrograms per liter. Now, when looking at um, arsenic um, in the um, environment, um, Mining is one important source, but it's actually also the usage of um, products um, that originate um, from mining. For arsenic, the very highest concentrations um, that we found um, were in um, ash ponds um, that are found close um, to um, thermal power stations. And in these ash basins, we um, frequently um, measured arsenic concentrations exceeding 1,000 micrograms um, per liter. And a big problem is that uh, these um, ash basins are um, very often located in riverine floodplains, as is the case here um, in um, Dachan, where this um, picture was taken. 
And this in the end means that there is a risk of groundwater pollution, potentially also river water pollution. And uh, in this specific example, um, even some um, drinking water wells are located nearby and um, in the first drinking water wells of Dahan, um, increasing arsenic um, concentrations could be observed in recent years. Now I uh, mentioned the linkages um, between um, raw materials extraction and um, water slash um, soil security. I will um, now take a look um, at a second aspect namely food security and its linkages um, to water and soil. And when we look at um, the upper um, Selenga Basin, food and water are as everywhere in the world, of course, strongly linked. Um, firstly, um, irrigation um, is um, commonly practiced and increasingly practiced um, in regions where um, there is a desire to increase um, the um, agricultural yields. The um, floodplains very often serve as pasture land, so we find um, high um, livestock densities very close to the river. And um, this um, agricultural land and pasture land is often um, associated to um, soil erosion. So um, there is a sediment transport from these um, surfaces um, towards um, the river system. And we will see later that this sediment input can have um, problematic um, consequences for the aquatic ecology um, of the rivers. But the mobilization um, of um, sediments um, can in some case also be something um, problematic and lead to a bioaccumulation um, of um, toxic substances in plants um, and animals through soils and water. So when we look at um, the uh, situation of agriculture in Mongolia, we can state that um, in the post-socialist period, initially um, from 1990 to 2006, um, the um, land that was cultivated um, decreased and um, only after 2006, um, some sort of um, turnaround um, could be um, observed. In 2009, the Mongolian government um, published a national plan for um, food security, which led to a massive increase in um, agriculture. And the declared political goal now is actually not only to be self-sufficient in terms of agricultural production, but even um, to um, produce for exports. Now, approximately under irrigation, but this fraction um, is increased. When we um, look at the um, relevant net, um, there is um, about um, four to um, 15 per um, hectare and year um, for um, step that is um, not in any way. So we can see I'm very sorry, it appears that uh, there was an interruption in the connection. Um, so I will briefly um, repeat what I last um, stated. Um, agriculture basically um, has an, uh, inc leads to an increase um, in surface erosion. So um, for agricultural land, um, this is um, significantly higher um, than um, for steppe. Um, it's a several fold um, 
increase um, in um, surface erosion. And the presentation is switched off now. Maybe you can again open the demonstration. I will. Can you see it now? Yes. Good. Um, so yes, as I had just mentioned, um, the um, increase in agriculture land in the end um, leads to an increase in um, surface erosion, which is several times higher on agricultural land as um, on uncultivated um, step land. Now, when we look at um, pasture land, um, an important um, development in the recent past is that we can see that um, following um, the turn um, of the millennium, um, there was a very significant um, increase in livestock numbers um, in Mongolia. So today, um, Mongolia has um, a livestock population exceeding um, 70 million. And you can see that from the 1970s to the 1990s, um, this was somewhere between 20 and um, 25 million. So there has been a very strong um, increasing um, trend here. And uh, livestock has um, a considerable impact also on um, the um, river system. Um, soil and riverbank um, erosion also um, are increased um, under the um, impact um, of livestock. But there is also um, an increase in nutrient loads if um, significant numbers of livestock um, enter um, the rivers. And this can, in the end, um, lead to um, changes in the aquatic um, fauna, but actually also aquatic flora. So when we look at um, sediment and uh, nutrient loading um, due to livestock, um, this um, has uh, an effect on the um, hyperaic zone um, in the Mongolian um, rivers. It me mechanically and um, biologically um, blocks um, the function of the hyperaic zone. Um, as you probably all know, this is the zone at the bottom of a river where there is um, an exchange between the surface and um, the um, groundwater. And um, this um, zone um, has several important functions. One is um, that it's um, a habitat or refuge for um, many different um, aquatic organisms. Um, it plays um, a very important role, for example, for um, many fish species to um, lay their wreck. And um, it plays a very important role for aquatic um, biodiversity. Now, when um, looking um, at the Hara River, um, some colleagues of mine um, looked at um, the um, changes in um, the um, total suspended um, sediments and um, the fine sediment um, fractions. And one thing that we can see is as we move from um, the upstream to the mid and downstream sections, um, basically the um, total suspended um, sediment concentrations increase more than sevenfold um, as compared to um, the upper parts of the river basin. We can see that um, within this um, sediment fraction, um, the um, fine sediment smaller than um, two micrometers um, in particle diameter increase from 21.8 to 29.2 um, micrometers. But um, we can also see that, um, for example, when we look at uh, nitrate nitrogen, um, the concentrations in the upper part of the river basin were so low that um, we could not even um, detect them. And this then increased to 0.12 and then ultimately 0.33 milligrams um, per liter. This is, of course, not only due to impact of livestock, livestock contributes to it, but um, there would also, for example, in a few places be um, a discharge of um, urban wastewater, for example. So basically, um, these um, changes have an uh, impact on um, the um, hyperaic um, 
zone in the rivers and um, one of the impacts um, can be seen here. We can see um, on the left side here um, sampling sites in the upstream part of the Kara River, where we can see that um, when looking um, in this case at the uh, macrosol benthos, um, we can see a relatively um, high level of um, taxa richness, which then um, increases as the um, turbidity increases and as the um, hyperaic zone is um, increasingly um, getting blocked. Um, we can see um, on the second picture here, something similar um, for the percentage um, of um, EPT um, organisms, um, which are an indicator of um, the state of the aquatic um, ecosystem. And we can see that their share really decreases from um, close to 80% um, in the upstream parts of the basin to less than 20% um, in the lower parts of the basin. And even if we look at different indicators, such as a Shannon index or other metrics, um, the picture would actually always um, be the same. And here we can state that um, this is um, very strongly linked um, to um, the fine sediment in influx that we um, see into the river system. And uh, this is mostly actually is um, the bioaccumulation and um, what we see here is, is um, heavy metal bioaccumulations in the liver and uh, muscle. So sorry, once again, I think the connection was lost. I think now you can once again, um, see the screen. Um, so um, we can see um, different um, fish species, which are mentioned here um, on the bottom. And basically what we can see is that uh, there is uh, different um, species differ in their tendency to bioaccumulate um, certain um, trace elements, but we can see that here, for example, zinc, arsenic, um, are bioaccumulated um, by fish that were um, caught. And um, this actually continues. It's not only zinc and um, arsenic, but um, here we see a few more elements. Um, nickel and uh, copper were not found um, really to be a problem. But here, if we look, for example, at um, mercury or lead, um, uh, substantial bioaccumulation um, of these elements was observed. Whenever you see a dotted line here, this means uh, this is um, a guideline value um, for food, particularly um, for fish that should not be exceeded. So we can see here in case of lead, and this is marked by these um, yellow to uh, brown dots, uh, we are not yet exceeding um, this value, but there is um, a clear sign um, that um, lead um, is bioaccumulated. So I now come to um, the end of my um, presentation. And um, in summary, we can state that um, water quality in the Selenga River Basin is in multiple ways connected to raw material um, extraction, to um, soil security and um, to food security. And when we look at um, these um, linkages, we can, for example, um, state that water security initially is a prerequisite for raw materials extraction and for food security. We need water um, in the raw materials sector. We need water as a prerequisite to um, produce food. We also need um, um, 
soil security is a prerequisite of food security, but um, unpolluted soils also play an important role um, for water security. And um, we can um, see that um, there are further linkages that, for example, raw materials such as coal in order to produce energy is a prerequisite for providing maybe safe drinking water or food um, to the population. So these are positive um, linkages, um, but there are also several ways in which um, negative um, impacts um, can work. So for example, the raw material extraction, as we saw, had a negative impact on water security and soil security um, in um, a direct way. But we also saw that um, food security um, can have an impact if, for example, um, we uh, mobilize um, sediments in the um, riverbanks, so even food um, production has an impact. And there are then also indirect effects. So if, for example, soils are polluted due um, to um, raw material extraction processes, this can have an indirect effect um, on um, water security so that um, even um, more indirect um, chains develop. Now that the soil has polluted the water, this will um, have another um, feedback loop um, to food security. So we can see um, the whole um, system is um, highly interconnected. And with this, I would like to thank all of you um, for um, your attention. Um, for those who wish, uh, you can um, also see um, in the end a list um, of um, references um, that I have used um, for this um, presentation. So if anyone would like to check up um, some details later, um, I would like to um, offer this to you. And um, if one of you is interested in finding out more about um, the activities of um, United Nations University, um, it's possible to follow us on um, all different sorts of um, social media. It's possible to um, have a look at our website and to um, subscribe to a quarterly newsletter. So thank you to, for um, your attention. And I'm, of course, um, open to um, answer your questions. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Uh, that's uh, Boris, thanks for excellent talk. And also thanks for coming and for accepting this invitation. I know that's very busy days for you or the last one, but anyway, and of course the Selenga in Mongolia is always good to, uh, to, to learn more about what is going on here. Uh, and uh, also just to the end of your talk, I think it's very, uh, could be good if we find some solution to sign some sort of agreement between Moscow State University and uh, United Nations uh, University. As far as I know, you said that it's quite a lot of possible options for collaboration, and that's going to be very interesting also for young scientists here at, at our university. <clears throat> And I would go to the questions which uh, we have in the um, uh, list from the audience. Uh, yes, Daniel, just I see that connection sometimes not good, so I'm afraid if we are losing you. Uh -huh. Yes, I see you are moving, then probably it's okay. Yes, I am here, uh, yes. Okay, 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 good. So the first question is from Natalia Olenikova, uh, Hydrochemical Institute uh, and uh, from Russia. And the, the question is, what is the share of underground runoff and its possible impact on the formation of the Selenga River water quality? Of, once again, please say again. Underground, under, so the question is about underground runoff, ground runoff. So, and how it can affect the water quality? Yes. The, um, the system. So, um, it uh, definitely has, um, the ground runoff has a major um, impact um, on the surface water quality um, when we um, look at the one hand on uh, mining areas, but also, for example, at um, urban areas where we find um, 
quite high um, levels of um, soil pollution. Um, this um, has um, definitely um, an effect on um, the um, river system. There has not really been, um, I think, a quantitative um, investigation at uh, the basin scale, um, how much this um, actually contributes. Okay, thanks. Uh, that can be some, I guess, that's really the topic which is not really uh, deeply covered in the region, I guess, yeah. So, and so then uh, there is another maybe comment, I would read it just um, to confirm that the topic is challenging. So the, the um, uh, comment from Mexico, uh, so I'm interested in these topics because in Mexico there are lots of rivers with several erosion problems and sediment transport. Uh, so maybe just so general comments and then I go to the, the question. The next question is from Dr. Vincent Azuka. So he uh, is uh, wondering about the that's the most rainfall uh, in West Africa is highly erosive, culminating to high irritability of soils. So, uh, uh, and transport sediments. So the most uh, intensive rainfalls. And the question, how can this menace uh, be combated in, on your research? So, uh, it's, Yes, so um, rainfall actually also plays a very significant role. And one thing that I have not uh, mentioned here is that um, in case of uh, the Selenga River Basin, actually um, there has been a significant uh, change in um, the types of rainfall. So um, in the past, um, it was typical to have um, rain events which were rather long lasting, but rather weak events. and um, there is um, an increasing trend towards um, short but very strong rainfall events. And these events actually um, tend to mobilize um, far more material um, than um, long lasting but weaker um, events. Do. Um, so this is uh, one aspect um, to take into consideration. The second aspect is that uh, I mentioned previously that um, in uh, dry lands such as um, Mongolia, we, we can see that a very um, significant share um, of um, the sediment loads in the rivers actually originates um, from river bank erosion. So um, the primary measure um, to, to um, consider is um, to um, stabilize or not destabilize um, the river banks. Um, so um, managing, for example, livestock numbers um, in the river banks, um, making sure that um, mining activities um, are restricted to um, regions outside um, the immediate um, vicinity um, of the rivers. Um, this really helps a lot um, to um, reduce um, this um, sediment input into the river system, but also um, potentially the pollutant input. Okay, thanks, Daniel. And maybe just as far as we are short in time now, very brief, uh, short question. What would you say the number one in the uh, future water-related research in the Selenga and Baikal Lake catchment? Yes, um, I think one aspect that is, of course, a very important one is the question what will happen um, regarding um, water diversion projects. Um, there have for a number of years been um, discussions on diverting water from the Selenga River system to mining operations um, in the southern part of Mongolia. They have not yet um, materialized, um, but there are plans to um, build dams and um, to divert water, dams both for um, hydroelectricity production and um, for um, water diversion. And this would have very significant um, impacts um, on this system. Um, it would have significant impacts on the hydrology, significant impacts on the um, 
aquatic ecology at this moment, we can state that um, we are actually talking um, when we look at everything that's upstream of Lake Baikal about um, one of the largest undammed river systems in the world. Um, and this would um, really um, change very dramatically um, if um, dams were built. Okay, then uh, we would uh, say again many thanks to Professor Cartet for this excellent lecture. Thanks, Daniel, a lot. Thank you for the invitation, Sergei. It was a pleasure. Okay, then we will now stop the translation for a few minutes before the next lecture. Yes, yeah, so I will make a short introduction and give you floor. Thanks. Yes. So, dear dear colleagues, uh, we are coming to the end end of the uh, lecture series, and there will be uh, the talk uh, by Professor Martina Floke, uh, also representing Germany and University of Bochum, and he, she also was involved in uh, the past to the collaborative research with Moscow State University in the uh, Baikal Lake uh, area, Seringa River, which was the talk of the previous speaker of Professor Karte. Uh, and uh, uh, since that, we 
got many different contacts and I'm very glad to uh, that Martina accepted the invitation to make this lecture and so, so it is also a very big pleasure to give Martina you a floor now for your lecture please thanks Sergey now I share my screen I think it should work now and you can see the screen now um yeah it's a pleasure for me too to um give this lecture under these circumstances um it's also an advantage using the uh, digital form all these platforms in um bringing lectures out to other people somewhere else in the world and thanks to sergey he made it happen that um, I can give this lecture, this talk to you and um, hope you are still in well trained and that you are interested in, although it's um, for some of you, it's already a little bit later this day. So I'm talking about integrating monitoring and water quality modeling to assess human impacts, which is um, a topic that I came across with over the last couple of years since starting to develop a global water quality model. And I was so happy to see yesterday, um, I participated in, in uh, Professor Cohen's talk to see also global figures. So um, there were several scientists out in the world who do global scale modeling. And I'm one of those. And we started to develop a global model um, several years ago. So we started in 2007 to do so. And um, with some uh, up and downs over the last couple of years, ending that I changed my position and that I'm now um, became a professor in, in the Ruhr University in Bochum last year. So now I do a new kickstart and I would like to um, introduce you to this field, the field of doing assessments from a global scale using data, of course, but also combine the data, the monitoring data with modeling uh, results. So I would like to introduce the how to model global water pollution and why, uh, introduce you to the data and model driven approach that we did um, a little bit insights into the global water quality model work wall. And I would like to show you two examples where I would like to use these to address water quality challenges. One example is on salinity and freshwater degradation that may affect food security. And uh, the second one is on fecal coliform bacteria affecting human health. But then we can use information also from the model or any other model to set priorities for data acquisition. And last but not least, I will finalize my presentation with the conclusions. So the overall assessment concept that we used is named the Dipsia approach probably well known, um, the drivers, pressures, state, impacts, and response. That's where, uh, what the acronym stands for. As the drivers, we use population information, variables of uh, uh, representing climate. The pressures are the different sources of pollutant loadings, by the state, we show the concentrations of in, -stream, uh, in streams and in lakes. And the impact, that's the interesting part is, I mean, what does it mean if we see a certain state of concentrations, but what does it mean in terms of human health or in terms of food security? And that's what we are really interested in and that's what we would like to know. 
because then when we think about the responses, we would like to address the impacts, we would like to reduce the impacts, but what can we do then in terms of um, addressing the state? What does it mean for the pressures if we um, look at responses like improving efficiencies of wastewater treatment plants and so on? And all through from the pressures, state impacts, we use data that have been monitored and we use the data that we uh, got from the model. You may now ask, why do we need to model global water pollution? So in terms of the SDGs and to get or to achieve um, uh, a sustainable world, we need to think not just only locally, but we need to go beyond the local regional scale to and finally cover the global one. So the overall methodology is to look at the analysis of available data, so monitored data, and then to combine these with the use of global modeling data. And here we do it because we want to compensate for very poor data coverage. So to get a global picture, we can't do so with only using the data that is monitored because we have, for example, found out that in terms of the, the uh, biological oxygen demand in Africa, for example, we got 23 stations in a global database nam named GEMSTAT. And that means that if you would like to take a look at Africa as a whole continent, there's only less data available. So here could we use the model results to compensate for a poor data coverage from monitoring. We combine two kinds of information that we already know pretty well. So the pollution loadings and the dilution capacity. So from the from the hydrology, we know how much water is in the rivers. Um, we can use this information to identify hotspot areas, but also areas that, which we can use for acquiring data. So where we can set new, new points for monitoring. We can also look at the um, at the options, as at the response options, and we can analyze the effectiveness of those. Estimate the trends over the next 20, 30 years. When we think about, for example, the SDGs, we can look into the year 2030. That's something that we can do with the models. And last but not least, to assess what are the impacts of the changes by, by climate and the further development uh, of socioeconomic drivers. So using monitoring data means using data from the ground, and that's a bottom-up analysis that we merge then with a top-down approach by, by the model. And this um, GEMSTAT is the, the database that we use to get some data. We finally used additional data that we found in the literature. And then we used the data, for example, to test the model and then to apply the model to generate new data and then to, to use the data to assess um, the distribution of the water quality on the continental scale in, in spatial temporal uh, terms. And from the data-driven analysis, we used the, the data that we found for the first preliminary data analysis. So to get a hint what how the situation, the conditions look like in a certain area. And then also to do some uh, statistical um, approaches and to look at the distribution of water quality from the data-driven perspective and then combine and compare the different outcomes from the data side, but also from the model side. 
So the the model as such is uh, based on, let's say, um, process-based equations that you can find in the literature. So water quality uh, or to model water quality is not something new. Um, we used scientific literature to take into account the um, these equations that are behind the model. And then we did a step-by-step -step development for the countries within these continents that we were looking at. And within this project or this study, we were focusing on the developing countries. Um, so we focused on the continents, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So the, the model from the global perspective, the, the model needs to be used for suitable questions. So we know that we cannot answer all the questions from the global perspective because the model is too coarse to get into too much detail. But what we were looking at is um, how the water quality evolves over time, for example. So where are uh, where is the water pollution getting better or getting worse when we when we look at the uh, substances that we assessed? And what is the extent and where are the hotspots located? What are the major sources leading to these hotspots? Those are the questions that we can address with the global model. And in that sense, the model is accurate enough to answer these questions. And then by doing improvements, because we had stakeholders on board, we get, got additional information that we fed into the model. Um, we finally improved the model quite a lot. And then because of all the uncertainty that is behind um, any model, we expressed the results also in terms of uh, uncertainty ranges. So as input data, we um, used loadings per capita. We collected data and information on treatment levels and connection rates, sanitation practices, number of animals, um, wastewater, climate, and so on. With a discharge, we used um, a model outcomes to drive world call, also surface runoff and land cover, land use and land use changes, as well as um, water temperature and so on. And as the main substances that we modeled um, is the biological oxygen demand. So BOD directly affects the amount of dissolved oxygen in rivers. And the higher the BOD, the more oxygen is depleted so meaning that less oxygen is available for aquatic ecosystems, and that could have an impact on, on fishery production that um, I'm not showing here. The total dissolved solids representing the salinity um, pollution, so high TDS results in undesirable taste. Um, high levels could also impede the function of certain industrial applications. So if the salinity pollution is too high, the concentrations are too high, then um, different industries um, can't work anymore using this water. But in terms of, for example, using high salinity um, or high saline concentrations in irrigation water, that increased the risk of salinity associated plant toxicity, meaning that there is a threshold um, and you can use or you should use um, TDS, uh, high, you should avoid high TDS concentrations in the uh, irrigation water. Fecal-coliform bacteria as an indicator of health risk, which is associated with the presence of elevated levels of fecal-coliform bacteria. So this has been used to address 
human health risk. And that was um, one of those reasons why we decided to model fecal coliform bacteria. And then looking at the different uncertainties the estimates of loadings or the dilution capacity and so on. We made sensitivity analysis, um, which is not part of my talk today, but um, we took that also into consideration. So here are the, from, from the overall structure, we differentiated between point sources and different sources. I know guess you all know what is meant by these. So we looked at the different sectors, domestic and manufacturing industries, but also agriculture, um, taking into consideration fertilizers, livestock manure, and um, irrigation return flows. Um, but also in terms of TDS, um, background uh, information or background um, pollution intakes, due to um, soils and due to, to weathering. In terms of vector coliform bacteria of higher importance have been the domestic sector, particularly the um, differentiation between sewered and non-sewered wastewater in, as a point source in uh, wastewater treatment plants, but also when it comes to the diffuse sources of um, of the uh, sanitation practices. So the model calculations, they are followed a system that I would like to briefly explain here. With the model, we do calculate the, the pollution loadings on, uh, let's say, for example, per capita scale or in terms of um, a pollution loading from a manufacturing industry um, together then with the dilution capacity, meaning the hydrological input and the in-stream processes, we finally end up in the calculation of the pollutant concentrations in a river. So it follows with an approach that is a common one also uh, well known from, um, from river basin models, something like that. So we do this calculation on grid cell level and the model is working on a five by five arc minute resolution, meaning nine by nine kilometers at the equator. So we know about the important water quality related challenges. So important challenges because we have to link our water quality uh, information to food security, for example, as from the SDG perspective, we have all these impacts also from water quality to food. It's not just only that the food production affects water quality, but water quality also impacts food security. And we have this SDG target on goal number six, ensuring availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. And one of the targets, 6.3, is to achieve um, water quality or addressing water quality, but also wastewater. And by 2030, to improve water quality by reducing pollution, eliminating dumping and minimizing the release of hazardous chemicals, materials, halving the proportion of untreated wastewater and substantially increasing recycling and safe reuse globally. So the untreated wastewater, that's an overall problem as we see that the more uh, the more people are living in urban areas, the more uh, wastewater is produced. But in, uh, in, in many countries, in Africa, for example, the wastewater is collected, somehow collected, but nevertheless, 
um, not sufficiently treated or it's not treated. So directly, you see always the direct intake of wastewater into the river. So no one knows about what's going on in the environment then. And here we find uh, the linkage with land and food because goal number two is to end hunger and achieve food security and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. And we have to link these two, for example, and they are affecting each other. So how to deal with that? And there were several linkages that we can take a look at. For example, salinity pollution. So we have the salt accumulation in the soils. We have irrigation return flows, which lead to a mobilization in the soil, but also to a plant uptake. And this affects the food security directly, or sometimes here by food production, um, it's a negative impact on food security. The organic pollution, low dissolved oxygens, conventional wastewater treatment addressed to some extent higher energy costs. We have the energy excess supply and supply, which is also uh, one of the SDGs in terms of um, looking at bioenergy crops, for example, then we would have to think about this SDG as well. But otherwise, we have a direct link from the low dissolved oxygen to the risk to biodiversity and fish production, which, by the way, also is represented in an SDG on inland and freshwater ecosystems. The excess of nutrients and eutrophication also um, a, a challenge from the agricultural perspective. So the agricultural runoff of nitrogen and phosphorus because of uh, fertilizer and other inputs, that's an effect on the excess nu uh, of nutrients leading to eutrophication, which in turn has a risk to biodiversity and fish production. And we come to an end to the inland freshwater ecosystems. In terms of the fecal coliforms or pathogen pollution, um, we have an exposure to fecal coliforms and pathogens in wastewater. So if this wastewater is going to be used for irrigation, for example, we transport the, um, the uh, fecal coliforms or other pathogens or to the environment, to the field, which increases a safe reuse as being addressed by SDG number six, where we then have to improve sanitation um, in order to, um, to reduce the uh, non-treatment of wastewater um, and the bacterial loadings, which may come end up with the uh, fecal coliforms again. So you see that's very complex and we have many linkages that we can address if we would like to look at the impacts of water on food security or vice versa within the overall SDG target context. And for the second example that I would like to show you today, when we look uh, at the link to human health, also from the water qualities perspective, so we have the target number 6.3 again under SDG 6, and we link it to um, human health, which is SDG number 3, good health and well-being. So by 2030, substantially reduce the number of death and illness from hazardous chemicals and air, water, and soil pollution and contamination. So you can already imagine that we have come some tangents here as well. Coming back to the first example on soil salinity and freshwater degradation, 
which may have hacked food security. So we know from literature that there is a great salty mess. For example, in the US, um, salt pollution threatens freshwater resources. And that's due to the fact that some of the areas are intensely fully managed and about 831 million hectares of the land um, are already affected by soil salinity and uh, 34 million hectare are salinized by irrigation. So some estimations showed that in the year 2009, about 1.1 billion people lived in the regions that had saline groundwater at shallow depth. So meaning that the, the, the salt water from the top lead to the groundwater aquifers. And that it already cost about 27 billion US dollar um, because of the land degradation in the irrigated areas. So we have already some numbers that we can deal with if we want to look at the impacts. But what about the data? And this is a brand new data set being published this year by uh, Torslund and Van Fleet, who collected data all over the world or that they found in publications, in databases, and so on. And they brought it together and uh, developed a global data set of surface water and groundwater based on salinity measurements. And this new database contains 60 million um, EC measurements uh, from more than 50,000 stations for rivers, lakes, and also from groundwater. And when you look at the countries and all those places that are colored, you get an information on how many stations um, can be found in the countries. And that's uh, quite uh, colorful in terms of the um, Americas. It's power, it's, it's colorful in, in Europe as well. Australia, and then it started in South Africa. Russia was a little bit late, but finally we found one to 100 stations. So somewhere in between one and 100 stations where data is available. So publicly available that it can be used for uh, such a database. So data is still sparse, particularly long-term data. Um, and that's in those areas that we can well cover with the model, although it's quite uh, a challenge to do so. And if we look at the distribution of the data between rivers, lakes, and groundwater, so most of the, water, most of the data is available here in some of the um, continents on the rivers. There are others. Um, where we found quite a lot of groundwater information, but um, less data is available for lakes and for reservoirs. So that's good news. So we see that we can use monitoring data, but some people need to collect those which are available. And then uh, Michelle, Michelle van Fleet, she um, developed also a global scale model to calculate the TDS concentrations as been shown here on this map. This is an outcome. And we can look at the level of salinity pollution with a global coverage. So TDS is used as a metric to, uh, for the salinity pollution. We can easily identify the hotspots. And those hotspots are very much related to irrigated land, particularly in arid regions, where you have the saline soils in combination with irrigation and, and, um, and intensive management. So from the anthropogenic loads, so 
not just only looking at the, the background and the weathering and, and soil intakes. We see from the global perspective that there is yeah, um, 44% related to irrigation, but 41% um, related to manufacturing activities. The share is small with 15% of the domestic sector, but these distributions vary between the different um, continents. So in, in Asia, for example, 60% is related to irrigation, same in Africa, while in Europe and in North America, um, higher shares, more than 65% can be uh, accounted to the manufacturing industries. So you see, we get different kind of um, drivers behind the whole models. We can identify the sources. And coming back to the monitoring again, using the monitoring and the modeling, integrate the two just using those uh, this information for mo model validation and testing which is of importance if we are going to use the data and would like to provide some outcomes for data sparse regions. And of course, the model has some good uh, examples, but also examples that are not looking that great. So there are still um, some of the processes not well covered, but we are working on this and still improving our model results. When we focus and zoom in to uh, South Asia, for example, you see that uh, on this map, there is um, the, the colors describe the number of months when um, uh, TDS concentration exceed 450 milligrams per liter. This 450 milligrams per liter is an FRO guideline. So above this threshold, the water should not be used for irrigation anymore. But if you look at this, um, at this region, these blue colors represent the irrigated area in that grid cell. And the darker the blue, the more area is irrigated. So, and you can see that the problem to some extent starts upstream in this highly irrigated areas. The, the water is concentrated with salinity flowing downstream and the downstream users can only use what they get from the upstream area, meaning that most of the water then exceeds already the 450 milligrams and shouldn't be used for irrigation anymore because then you drive this whole process that more and more of the, of the area gets uh, high pollution in high salinity pollution and um, can then affect food security. And in South Asia, we found out that more than 200,000 square kilometers, which means 22% of the irrigated area that might already be irrigated with saline water that exceeds this threshold. And in this um, figure on the, on the lower left, you can get an um, insight into the different countries and um, India is really outstanding in terms of the area that is at risk. So then getting in additional information, new information um, from remote sensing, that's something that we are now started with to take into consideration also this type of information. Looking at uh, the soil salinity changes, um, between 1986 and, and 2016. And this is a group, um, I think they are from Wageningen, um, working on this issue. And they combined in this map information of soil properties 
um, using the thermal infrared imagery from remote sensing, plus field observations wherever they could find some. And then they used a machine learning framework to um, prepare this kind of map. And it's hardly to see, I have to say, this is uh, a map out of, of uh, the paper, but there are some green dots where we have the area uh, where the um, saline soils um, significantly decreased. But we have also the yellow ones, and we find these yellow ones all over the place in, in, uh, in Asia, particularly in those regions that are irrigated, where we um, see um, a significant increase between 1986 and 2016. So in addition, monitored data from remote sensing in combination with data monitored on the ground could help to um, improve also the model, but can also be combined with model information to um, look at the impacts on uh, affecting food security. So changing from uh, food security to the second example on human health, um, looking at the fecal coliform bacteria, for example, which is um, an indicator that we related to health risk. And we look at the, the data from the river management. We found some uh, monitored data. And the pollution loadings, they can be estimated by um, cause and effects uh, approaches. So from the health impacts perspective, um, we meant that we would like to, or we looked at the number of data uh, of people that come in contact with surface waters through washing, cleaning, and so on. So we were not focusing on drinking water because it's hardly uh, hard to identify the number of people who use surface waters for drinking water purposes only, because very often water is used in bottles or water is used from groundwater. So in this study, we, we um, developed a database. We used some data from GEMSTAT, but also found data in national statistics and uh, other literature and ended up with uh, almost 90,000 measurements. But as you can see from the map, um, only almost 4,000 stations, which is from the perspective of the three country uh, continents, um, quite less. Particularly in, in Africa, um, we ha don't have good information from the ground. But here, for example, Latin America on the, on the east side, there are um, several thousand uh, stations. Um, as I mentioned before, when we look into the calculation of FC loadings, um, we differentiated um, particularly the, the uh, information in terms of sanitation practices of the population that is connected to uh, a sewer system and the people that are connected um, to different kind of wastewater treatment. So primary, secondary, and tertiary treatment. But then um, we, do, we also see that there is wastewater, a huge wastewater amount that is not treated or not sufficiently treated. Um, the population that is not connected um, we have the uh, hanging latrines and the open defecation that we took into consideration and then um, some other type of treatment. And it, it ended up in um, an FC loadings map as being shown here. Um, you can clearly see those 
regions where we have a high population density because total population or pop number of population very much drive the FC loadings. It's also related to the diets in given countries, um, but the, the key drivers um, are the number of people um, that lead to these high loadings. And when we look at the, the causes of fecal coliform pollution and identify the dominant annual uh, fecal coliform loading sector on a catchment scale, we, you can see from the colors, it's mainly purple and, and yellow colors that you can see. The yellow colors are the, is the domestic sector that is skewered. And the, um, the purple one is the domestic sector non steward So in, in um, at looking at the loads and at the share in Latin America, the yellow is the dominant color. So the, the, water, the, the wastewater is collected and it's sewered to some extent uh, only touch it, uh, only primary treatment uh, or a non-sufficient treatment and less purple colored. So the wastewater that is non-sewered and there are only minor regions where you can find it. But looking at, into the African country, for example, you see that the dominant color is the purple one, meaning that the um, the, the intake of fecal coliforms come from the domestic side, yes, but then from the non-sewered um, uh, non part, meaning that there is quite uh, some unsafe uh, practices, but also uh, safe practices, sanitation practices, but leading to the wastewater that is dumped into the rivers. And in Asia, we have a, a share, um, a well-balanced share, so to say, between the steward and the non-steward um, part of the domestic sector. So the water quality hotspots can then be identified, bringing together the loading information with the, um, the river discharge and the, the in-stream processes that um, drive the fecal coliform uh, concentrations in, in the rivers. And this, um, show, this map shows the um, average concentrations of the month August, but as an average for the years 2008 and 2010 to 2010. So it's August, um, the average of August 2008, 2009, and 2010. Why did we do so? Because of the climate effects. Um, we didn't want to look at just one particular month as it's too much affected by the climate of the given month. And then, because we would like to look at the uh, at the concentrations and um, how many rivers and river switches are affected. That has been of our particular interest. And so we looked over the overall time series. Um, and then we looked into not just, as I mentioned before, and on this map for a particular month, but we looked at the different months all over the years. And that's lead us to the figure here where we have a minimum river kilometer or the river stretches that are affected by fecal coliform pollution and a maximum one. And that means that in, in a minimum for Asia, for example, um, almost 500,000 river kilometers are affected by fecal coliform pollution. 
And that could end up in a maximum of almost 800,000 river kilometers, um, meaning that we have some months where we have a higher or lesser dilution capacity leading to lower uh, concentrations or higher concentrations. And to cover that, um, we decided to use this kind of uncertainty ranges to uh, provide the information on the river stretches that are affected. And overall, um, we see that for this given um, time, 2008 to 2010, one third of all the river stretches in uh, Latin America, Africa, and in Asia, they are affected by um, fecal pollution. And this is of importance because we want to know then how many people can get in contact with this water that is affected by fecal coliform pollution. But coming back to the, the data and the monitoring side, of course, we wanted to test the model, we wanted to evaluate the models, and therefore we need the data. We found several data, as I mentioned before, in the literature and um, provided the, um, the uh, figures like here, where we uh, compared the observed data against our simulated outcomes. And it's, it looks like um, a huge cloud around the, the optimum line, um, as you can see here. And that is um, due to the fact that the model underestimates and overestimates the data that um, has been monitored and observed. But nevertheless, if we look at the, uh, at the different classes of uh, the model, for example, shown here, of low pollution, meaning it's suitable for a contact if the fecal coliform units are below 200 in a 100 milliliters. And the moderate, high, and severe pollution with the uh, different um, thresholds. So if a, th a threshold of 2,000 fecocoliforms is um, exceeded, then you can say all thresholds are exceeded and the water is um, more or less not really suitable. Um, it's not suitable for contact. It's neither suitable for drinking and it should also not be suitable for irrigation purposes. So and if we take into consideration these classes, um, we took a look at our model out outcomes um, into, and how well the model behaved to these classes. And in the same class, we see that about 50% of our model results agreed at least with the same class. And, um, and the differences in the classes showing where we have the bias. So in this terms, we use the, the, the results of monitored data, um, data driven analysis, so to say, but we wanted to know how many people are affected and get a health risk. And that has been very, very tricky. And here we found that there's almost no data available. So the, the rural population using water for drinking or getting in contact, uh, for example, bathing and so on, there is almost no data or only less data available. Nevertheless, we use this information of um, people getting in contact and using it for drinking water and then um, estimated the number of people that could get in contact with the uh, polluted surface water. So we looked at the river stretches and uh, in the vicinity and in the estimated the number of people living in this vicinity of the river stretches and um, did some first estimates here. So it's hardly to get this information, but nevertheless, it provides a first uh, insight into how many people may be at risk from getting in contact with this highly polluted water. So last but not least, um, 
we wanted to know or we wanted to use the model not just only to look at the impacts and making the the comparison with monitor data we wanted to support monitoring as well using the model information and um when we when we look at the african continent for example which is shown here we have the frequency of months exceeding the to the threshold of 2000 faculty coliform cfus in uh, 100 milliliters from this global database gemstat we got this number of measurement points so stations where we got uh, data these are these blue dots so not that many as you can see by our literature research we could do a little bit more but very much bias to south africa where we got quite a lot of data and and other regions here but what about those where we identified hotspots? What about those? I mean, we cannot verify our hotspots, but we would um, do in a, the other way around. We would say these could be the priority areas, the priority river stretches where monitoring should be um, performed. So I'm at the end of my talk i would like to finalize with some conclusions so in terms of the dipsy framework it's a valuable one looking um at at uh, problems from the causal chain connecting drivers to pressures identifying then impacts and um, develop responses the modeling efforts um they have been a prominent source of information if we would like to look at the impacts on food security and on human health as we hardly uh, it's it's we can hardly get information from uh, monitoring in that term the concentration hotspots are for most of the uh, substances that we have been looking at in densely populated areas so particularly where wastewater treatment is limited or even uh, or in other areas that are intensively managed um, for agricultural purposes. The assessment of water quality impacts is difficult in quantitative terms as um, in situ data and sometimes even modeling data are lacking. So we need to bring forward new methods and integrate them into our data and model driven approach so we do so at the moment in um, adding information from remote sensing um, so there is still a strong need for regularly monitored up-to-date and readily available data um, and i fear that those uh, data become more and more sparse in the future um, but it would be um, very important to have this information. So monitoring should encompass the state, the impacts, the main sources, and also the response options for all contaminants. That would be one of my wishes so that we can uh, take a look at the food security and environmental and health risks. So that has been my last slide. I would like to thank you for your attention and i'm uh, happy to answer your questions thank you a lot martina so that's very on this very global uh, overview would be a good point to come to the finish of the of the lecture course uh so i would uh, uh, Mm, retranslate the questions that we have so that there is a uh, few the first is uh, coming to the um, uh, slide which was on the, uh, in, the in, in the middle of the talk somewhere about the remote sensing application for soil salinity so could you comment a bit about the methods uh, which were used to uh, make these estimates um, I unfortunately do not more than and what I wrote here on this slide, as I'm not uh, part of that group 
that has been working on it. Mm -hmm. um, the what I only know is that they use different kind of information. So I mean, so far, so far we only have uh, maps providing soil properties. So that's information that we have at, at the hand since several years. But we have seen that these soil property maps have some disadvantages and that they do not uh, change over time. So it's always difficult to, um, let's say, um, maintain the development of such maps. And in this regard, this group was um, using uh, remote sensing information and combined it with the soil properties maps that we already have at hand. And they found that there are even more, uh, even more soils being affected. They identified those, and those are these regions that are um, in yellow showing this um, significant increase. But on the other side, they found also some regions where the um, soil salinity uh, reduced over over this time frame. So, if you want to like, would like to find out more, um, please take a look into the into the paper. Um, it's very interesting. Okay, interesting. Good, thanks. And uh, so, the next question is coming from the um, University of Trento and uh, Leo Lumens, and the question is about if you can give some numbers on the estimates for the FC pollution in Europe or in North America. Um, for North America, we are actually working on that continent. Um, I, we have not yet prepared the numbers there. And there is another paper from a colleague, uh, a former colleague of mine, um, it's a paper, Reda et al. 2015, I think, if I remember correctly. There we had um, prepared the model or developed the model for Europe. But um, at the moment, I don't have the numbers at hand. But we see spots and we see hotspots in Europe as well, particularly in the south. So in Spain, we see uh, quite a lot of uh, input, but not just only from the population, but also from menu. <clears throat> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's also the question for regarding the areas which are not uh, touched a lot in your talk or partly touched. So about Russia, more precisely, the question from the student of uh, Moscow State University, Kristina Prokopieva. Uh, has mm -hmm. the modeling been applied for study of water quality in Russia? Not yet. So um, the the model has first been developed uh, for Europe. Then it was extended to the developing countries. Uh, this has been a work for the uh, United Nations Environmental Program. Environment Program. So that's why we focused on uh, these three continents that I showed today. But we we are actually working on the global scale and to um, cover the whole world. That means that we are working on, on Russia, and, uh, Russia as well. Um, I don't actually not know how good the data is that we can get from monitoring from Russia, but maybe I have to come back to you then. <laughs> but we do so um, at the moment and we have the uh, FECA coliform model already running on a global scale, but um, not yet uh, well tested. Yes, it can be big problems so with this. And what do you think What's the most problematic uh, in terms of the data for calibration and verification of the model? Which areas are the most problematic with Yes, availability of the data sets for water quality from your from this global perspective, which you know, mm. best of all. Um, I I have some I've uh, some decades of experience in global scale modeling in terms of hydrology and water use, for example. But 
um, working on water quality issues is um, is really more is is really a challenge compared to the other two um, because we we found out that uh, we, first we need to be more precise in the allocation of for example wastewater uh, intakes and that means that when you when you look at water quantity issues if the water use is in in a grid cell or in the neighboring grid cell it doesn't matter for the water uh, quantity balance but in terms of water quality it matters where you have the intake and we have but in, in, in terms of, for example, salinity pollution, we, we very often see the high salinity concentrations in the headwaters. And if we look from the global perspective in the headwaters, that means we look at one or two grid cells only. And that is, uh, is very difficult to be addressed with a global model because the, the, the intakes are high the, the pollution intakes are high in on the grid cell, but then in the headwaters, the dilution capacity is very, very low. So there is almost no water um, to dilute the high pollution. And it takes several grid cell river flow um, to, to get the model in the in the um, in the let's say in a well performing category compared to the monitoring data. So that's something that has to be taken into consideration. So the allocation uh, is, is, really, um, is really key compared to water quantity issues. Okay, and uh, thanks Martina for this detailed explanations. And then I guess the last question we will uh, proceed. Uh, from most of the students of Moscow State University, Viktor Ivanov. Uh, so the, can we measure or model uh, the impact of FC pollution by animals? Is it sufficient? Is it possible? Um, so um, the, the intake from menu from animals is behind the model as well. So we, we look at it, but um, we do not look at it like um, we do not consider huge stables where, where a huge amount of manure is, um, is produced and then probably dumped into the rivers. That is something that, that we know from other studies, from colleagues from, uh, from the Netherlands, from Wageningen, for example, in China. That is something very common that the, the manure is directly dumped into the river. And that's something that we do not address in our model because you need to know then as the, the manure from the animals is, has to be seen as a point source and not as, as a diffuse source. If you look at it as a diffuse source, then the processes on land reduce the pollution intake into the river. But if you look at it as a, as, a, uh, as a point source, then you can model the direct intake into the rivers as well. And then it has um, a much, much higher impact than it has um, in the way that you look at the animals just living on the fields. Okay, so it's coming to the night time in Moscow or late <laughs> evening. <laughs> so yeah, you, said, you had already a long day, <laughs> right? <laughs> we are, we are, uh, long, three long days of lectures. So thank you again, Martina, a lot. It was very big honor for us to have your lecture here. And I know that it's very also important for at least Russian scientists, young scientists and students to see this approach and uh, this global vision, which is you are uh, developing. Thank you very much for an excellent yeah. talk. Thank you, Sergei. So for the, so in general with this, we will finish now.
the lecture course. Yes, Martin, thank you. And just I shortly will uh, uh, announce that this is uh, coming, we, we came to the end and that's the, uh, upon the, if the lecturers will not have any um, objections, we will leave the recorded video on the, on the channel and on the website. I'm just uh, recorded videos of the lectures. And uh, so we would be happy to answer or to pass your question to the lecturers as well. If there are more or any, please use the emailing address. And also for other technical issues, if there are some about the school itself or conference, please welcome. We would be happy to uh, stay in touch with the participants and we were happy to see quite big numbers of interest to the lecture course. And with this word, words, I would also say thanks to the organizing committee who are master students of um, um, hydrology department of faculty of geography. Three nice ladies and uh, one uh, gentleman. So, and with this, uh, the school can be announced as uh, closed. Thank you very much.